Hello, everyone. Uh, you're very welcome to Solstice here today, uh, to the seminar associated with the Irish-Estonian collaboration, There is a Forest in My Backyard, but my house is built from trees grown far away. Uh, it's wonderful seeing uh, the space of people who are reimagining how we may live better together in a local, in Navan and Meath, but also in a global community. It is exciting that Solstice holds this prestigious gathering of makers, architects, artists, suppliers, and the public coming together. And it is, in fact, our largest gathering uh, since COVID isolation began in March 2020. So it's a special celebration, and you're all very, very welcome today. It's a town meeting, so to speak, a meeting of dialogue, exchange, and sharing of techniques and experiences. We would like to thank and welcome the participating architects for the wonderful installations and working with the team here so well, our team here so well this week. And in ways, I've been personally looking for a way to work with the Irish Architecture Foundation for some time, and I've been very impressed by the excellent Outwards Questioning Programme and curatorship of Natalie Wiedek, and we are delighted with her collaboration and are committed to future partnerships. This, in turn, has led to new friendships uh, with the Estonians and with Raoul, Ayet, B210, and we are very welcome. We had such a wonderful day yesterday, um, sort of exploring our own uh, cultural heritage here, so thank you. But also to the Irish curators as well, to uh, Sinjin and Julian Brady of uh, Elder Architects, and to uh, Ayet Alagu as well, who helped produce the exhibition. And more importantly, obviously, there's a lot of teams behind this. So our old team here, which is, will be serving you this wonderful lunch, but who have been working all through the work with the architects, and also to the Irish Ar Architecture Foundation as well, and their team there as well for their help in putting together the event as well. So it is also a great pleasure to welcome Peter Carroll of A2 Architects and senior lecturer at Seoul to chair today's seminar. And Peter is a fantastic collaborator and has collaborated with Solstice and uh, with myself personally on numerous occasions and has this wonderful open query and uh, spirit of borderlessness, uh, which I've always enjoyed uh, working with. And thank you very much. And also, we get the opportunity to welcome Shelley and Shelley McNamara and Yvonne Farrell of Grafton Architects to speak uh, from their home place of sorts having designed this art centre in 2005. And this building has contributed so much to the way we work together with new and different communities. And in ways, it keeps me questioning and in imagining new artistic dialogues with artists, arts organisations and the public. And it's very, very hard to leave. The possibilities remain engaging, challenging, stimulating and curious in how we work. And this today, and this collaboration between Estonia and Ireland and with the IAF and ECA is part of that curiosity. And finally, we just need to thank also the Arts Council here uh, for their support and their particular support through the Engaging in Architecture scheme, but also to wish them a very happy birthday because the Arts Council in Ireland is celebrating its 70th birthday this year and basically the arts would not exist in Ireland uh, without their continual support. Uh, for artists, arts organisations and architects. So thank you very much and I'd like to welcome Raoul and Natalie now. Thank you. Hi everybody. Um, my name's Natalie and I'm Director of the Irish Architecture Foundation. This is Raoul and um, Director of the Estonian Centre for Architecture and I'm I've got some notes, but Raoul is going to ad lib after I finish. Um, he had a dream last night about what he was going to say, so I don't know what he's going to say. So anyway, um, just to give you some background information, uh, myself and Raoul, we met um, a few years ago in 2015 in Tallinn, and the Irish ambassador in Tallinn at the time was a man called um, Frank Flood, and um, he has since been posted to Canada, so he's still following the forests. But anyway, Frank wanted to talk, to set up a meeting between Irish people and Estonian, or Irish architects and Estonian architects to uh, look and 
see if there are creative links and enterprising links between um, through the lens of architecture and timber. And, and straight away, um, myself and Raoul kind of had a wonderful simpatico, not least because both our organizations do similar things, like we um, run exhibitions and events and biennales, and um, we both do open house. We do open house Dublin, you do open house Tallinn. So we're, we're very similar. Um, and, um, and within this context of why we're here today, and from the meeting in the embassy, um, we were both motivated by a local and national need um, to really uh, create opportunities for our immensely talented architects to exchange, to build, design with wood, and then in tandem encourage a communication about timber production in Estonia and uh, in Ireland. So um, a few years later, um, not immediately, Raoul came to Dublin, and so he went away and did loads of work on establishing how we could work together um, and came to Dublin and he asked me to join the ECA um, or the IF to join the ECA. You'd done a lot of groundwork, you had created a, a sort of a framework for delivery, you had found some core funding from Enterprise Estonia at the time and we, we devised a competition called Woodworks which was a competition to find curators, it was an open call and um, that involved then an exchange between um, curators and the exhibitors and then the exhibition which is here and our intention after um, this exhibition is to uh, tour this to the Tallinn um, Architecture Biennale which opens in September this year. So, um, so our goal um, was that this framework would amplify the networks, partners and opportunities of everyone involved. Everyone involved so off we went and here we are. So at the competition stage, we weren't sure what to expect. Um, um, and myself and I are always very excited by the unconventional, the experimental, and culturally engaged. And we hoped that the winning curators and exhibitors would push uh, boundaries around the use of wood in contemporary architecture and its response to the essential societal technolo technological and environmental uh, challenges. So the winning proposal, there is a forest in my backyard but my home built, is built from trees grown far away, curated by Estonian Irish architects B210 um, in Tallinn and Alder Architects in Dublin did just that. Um, it was, it was it's just a really engaging exceptionally um, uh, creative response to the brief. And the role of the curators was to set the theme and concept and to construct the narrative and title of the exhibition and the publication. And, and they were crucially charged with the responsibility of selecting the exhibitors. So the assemblage upstairs reveals innovative curatorial approaches to exhibition making while also generating new ways of thinking and understanding our built and natural environments. Um, so. I was wonderful to run upstairs this morning and see it. I saw some of it on Wednesday, but to see it completed was fantastic. It's just gathered in, in, in this great gallery in Solstice is a number of site-specific installations um, that are diverse in structure and form, in function and, and meaning and story. There are so many levels and they're all made by very accomplished architect teams. Um, the works act as a three-dimensional evocation of the research of these architects, experimentation and exchanges between two cultures. And what unifies them is the essence and presence of wood. The presence can be explicit or implicit, but it remains the core material of influence and investigation. Uh, in my view, this exhibition is not just a matter of relating architecture to wood, but rather of explaining the relationship between human construction and the tree as a living being that is part of an ecosystem, part of life. Um, so rather than being an exhibition in itself, this exhibition is an important site for testing and prototyping. And it is also here at Solstice, um, with thanks to the team here and Peter Carl, a meeting place for conversation about possibilities. So there is, there is more to this than the exhibition. So I just want to say a few thank yous, and I know um, you probably will echo them as well, Raoul. Um, I'd really like to thank the curators for staying true to your belief uh, in the curatorial direction, um, in, even in the most challenging times. Um, lots of the process and exchange was affected um, by um, the pandemic, as we all were, um, but we, 
and you kept to it, and, it was, and the result is upstairs um, for everyone to see. The, I really want to thank the exhibitors for exi uh, illustrating our ideas in such an engaging and creative way, and I, I can't wait to hear from everybody today. Um, the team in the Sony Centre for Architecture, um, Rao's team, Art, etc., and everybody there, and also my team, my colleagues, um, um, Bernadine and Felicity and Blohine, um and Vanessa. And also, I really want to also thank um, the sponsors, Estonian um, Enterprise Estonia, Enterprise Ireland, and the Arts Council for the engagement program here, but also really want to acknowledge the support um, of the Estonian ambassador to Ireland and her team in, in Harcourt Street in Dublin. Um, but last but not least, the fantastic team at Solstice, so wonderfully led by the wonderful Belinda, the director, and thank you to uh, Deirdre, Paula, Nell and Brenda and um, their newest temporary only for this exhibition curator of the engagement program, Peter Carroll. Thank you. Um, and so, Belinda, you have provided the space for the show to come into being. And if we didn't have you and your public interface and your wonderful generosity, it would be like a tree falling in the forest. No one is around to hear it, so it doesn't make a sound. So thank you. Um, so I hope this event here today will encourage future initiatives in the future development of timber and wood, innovation and architecture between our both, co both our countries. So Raoul, over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. It's very difficult to have something here. Um, dear Ambassador, dear friends, good morning. Terehomikut. What you would what you would say what you would say if you are climbed up in the high mountain, steep mountain? Most likely, you would just be silent and filled with a gratitude, the gorgeous, the, the feeling that uh, you are, you are, you are just speechless. You are very thankful, and I am as well. Uh, I feel like uh, up, um, you might be same as up in in Tara, Tara Hill yesterday which is connects us with uh, our ancient history and wood as well is part of our our ancient history and um, that gratitude leads us to uh, to thankful that uh, that I understand that uh, the thank you to creators that uh, you gave the soul to this exhibition this wonderful exhibition and thank you to um, other artists, architects, colleagues who, who gave the body to this soul to describe wooden architecture in many, many layers. More layers than uh, even we commissioned first. It was a learning process for us and very inspiring. And all this is, is expressed as well on this exhibition and uh, of course thank you Natalie to you that uh, when we met and when we when I s described uh, our, our vision our, our aim that you you do believe believe that uh, that hard hard path uh, hard um, Work is uh, is blessed. You did believe that uh, it wasn't it wasn't easy, but it was blessed. As we we see, we can gather together today. Uh, it was a difficult time. We we put uh, as Natalie said a lot of uh, layers on the idea what we 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 saw in the end of the day today, and uh, we got more than we asked. Our architecture is a joint effort, as you know, many of us uh, doing uh, our, our job together with, uh, with, uh, 
with others to make uh, value to society. And that, that's uh, the aim of the project as well, to, to do things, things uh, to, uh, uh, things together with our friends. Um, not to find the easy path, but the uh, difficult path, which gives, uh, in the end of the day, to us uh, more satisfaction. And maybe for the future as well, something that uh, leads us um, for to a sustainable, more sustainable society. And for the, for the end, uh, I would say that in Estonian we have um, a say, saying that uh, the wood is a new concrete. But I think that uh, here it's appropriate to say that uh, wood is a new clay. Thank you. Tere homekust, quida sul lahob, dear ambassador, uh, friends, curators, participants, Belinda, Natalie, and Raúl. Thank you very much for the opportunity to chair this uh, wonderful seminar and uh, to introduce the exhibition to the public. Uh, my name is Peter Carroll. I'm a senior lecturer at the School of Architecture at the University of Limerick. I'm also the director of A2 Architects um, in Dublin. Um, the last time I stood here was probably in 2004 on this stage when it was on site, the wonderful solstice. And Shelley and Yvonne introduced this wonderful cave space with this incredibly powerful diagonal coming down. And I remember being struck about the specialness of what they brought to this amazing town and the fulcrum that they created. And it's lovely to be back here chairing an event in this particular space where we were standing here, so I'm very thankful for that opportunity. Um, my interest today, I'm going to be very brief. Um, my sole purpose here is made possible by the Arts Council Engaging with Architecture um, initiative, which looks to promote ambitious, innovative, and creative projects. And I certainly think Woodworks uh, when it comes to the collaboration here between Irish and Estonian architects and indeed centres of architecture um, is a very powerful thing. Um, two countries, 3,000 kilometres apart, um, working together and looking to collaborate and understand each other's cultures. Um, so I'm very, very interested in what the conversation this afternoon will entail and I look forward to questions and answers from the floor. Um, so without further ado, I might ask uh, Sinjin and Ayet up to uh, basically introduce themselves and uh, introduce the curation of the wonderful Woodworks exhibition. And I will subsequently then introduce each of the participants to the stage. So thank you very much. Hi there. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, and thank you to everybody for coming today. It's, uh, it's wonderful to see so many uh, familiar faces here on a Saturday, um, as well as people that we, we've yet to meet. Um, I suppose just to introduce um, ourselves, my name is Sinjin Walsh um, of Older Architects. Um, when uh, uh, from the background that um, I have in practice, I've got a particular interest in, in timber construction. Um, I've worked with on a, a number of, of buildings which use timber as its primary structure. Um, at the outset of the project, I was also undertaking a master's in design for disassembly and reuse of timber. So I had a lot of uh, a lot of timber going on in my mind. Maybe when um, when I received a, a message from um, uh, Professor Hugh Campbell to Dr. Elizabeth Schott and my, my, my supervisor, myself, suggesting that we um, think about maybe putting something together for this process. Um, it was, it was a, it seemed like a great opportunity to bring some of the thinking and the work that 
we were undertaking in research to, to have other people think about it and maybe look at it. Um, I suppose the first thing I did at that point was I, I wondered, did I know any Estonians uh, who could help? Um, and luckily, I, I did. Um, it, it could be said that our, um, this collaboration started nearly 15 years ago when I and I studied um, in Copenhagen on Erasmus together. Um, so uh, I, I reached out and I was, uh, so su I was really pleasantly surprised at how perfectly um, B210 architects were, um, how perfectly suited they were to working on this curatorship um, together. Um, so maybe, I, would you like to say something about B210? You can even, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So hi, I'm, I'm Helmi, one of the curators from P210. Hi all, my name is Marie from P210. Uh, and um, I might add yeah, a few words. Uh, I think I was particularly interested in this collaboration between two countries. Uh, yeah, in the past we have uh, curated in 2013 uh, Tallinn Architecture Biennale uh, on a bit different topic, recycling socialism. And then in 2017, um, I was curating an exhibition together with the Belgium architects, and uh, I remembered uh, very interesting discussions from that time about uh, uh, this yeah, effect of uh, bringing two cultures together brings us, uh, the knowledge and uh, different methods. So I was uh, very pleased uh, when, <laughs> when uh, yeah, the open call was announced and uh, uh, as, as, yeah, that comes up, I think, in the presentation as well, but as, as for Estonians, timber is quite a regular material and, of course, we have had uh, experience uh, uh, building from timber uh, plus uh, uh, as we have been teaching at the academia as well uh, then we had uh, taught for six years uh, studio for the uh, first year students uh, which is building uh, small scale structures in Estonian uh, nature uh, uh, and the interior design uh, department so I think uh, it was many topics uh, which uh, really uh, came together. So, um, I suppose when starting off the process, I mean, I've, I'm, I'm probably ashamed sh to say my, my knowledge of um, Eastern Europe is not that fantastic. So really just figuring out sort of, uh, you know, exactly where Estonia was, was, you know, slightly revealing, um, reflecting badly on, on my own knowledge. But what was fascinating is, is when we started chatting about it, our, maybe our different takes on timber and how it um, is perceived. Um, in Ireland, timber is, I, I don't think one would describe it necessarily as a traditional form of construction. We, we build a lot in masonry, or have done over the last um, 50 years and, and timber frame is becoming more and more common. But it, it, by comparison, I, I, I understand that timber, timber is used you know, historically far more frequently by, in Estonia. Um, uh, uh, also, I think there's something to be said maybe about the landscapes um, in Ireland. If, if it's probably fair to say that the forests we have, um, many of them are, are plantation and maybe lack a natural quality that could be found in, in Tallinn. So in a way, the, the sort of different perspectives that we brought to it from that, um, from that area was, was interesting. Um, so I, I was, um, as I mentioned, looking at disassembly and, and reuse. And in that, that world of, of thinking about how material comes to be at the end of a process, how it get, makes its way into a building and makes its way back out, was, was really quite um, um, interesting to me at that time. And uh, I think that it's fair to say that you were quite interested in the, the sort of the forest and the, the quality of timber and the uniqueness that a tree has, that it's, it's something which is um, obviously uh, one of a kind. Um, and that as that, as that tree is, is translated and turned into a standardized product for 
construction, typically. Um, and, then, and then again is, is encapsulated into a structure, which becomes again unique or bespoke, um, largely. Um, so it's, it was that sort of transition of material from, from the natural environment through to, um, through to a sort of formation, um, reformation again, um, assemblage, uh, which was the main sort of overarching theme of our, our proposal. Um, we were also quite interested in transport and, and also the end life of material, which many of the practices have looked at. Um, so that, that was sort of the main, the main thrust of our idea. But maybe, Hami, if you'd like to say some more about the title. So. Yeah, I'll just uh, put the next slide. Yeah, so, so the title, there is a forest in my backyard, but my house is built from trees grown far away. For us, that is the beginning and the end of the process. So in this context, the forest is a source for woods, but also it's a whole and rich environment in its own. And there are many, many ways of how trees can be realized in timber, house, home, and structure. So the title posed somewhat open-ended statement to investigate what happens in between and why it happens as it happens. And there are many factors that influence the outcome, like logistics and uh, and transport, but also the cultural different approaches. And uh, I think we as curators in the end really appreciated the slight differences between Irish and Estonian architects. We, we found that maybe Irish architects had more physical materialistic approach to timber and wood, whilst Estonians consider the tactile qualities and it's a nice contrast. Okay. Uh, we started uh, the whole process one and a half years ago, uh, and it was uh, the beginning was the opening seminars. Uh, maybe some of you followed this, so we thought it would be really uh, uh, nice to actually understand the context uh, where we are working. So uh, we invited uh, different people from the industry uh, to be a part of the seminars. Uh, who would explain us the logistics and yeah, what happens after the forest is taken down. Uh, also, we, um, we invited different speakers uh, who would explain us uh, the situation of forests uh, and forestry in both countries, because I think there are uh, differences uh, in that as well. Uh, and then, of course, architects and think thinkers and um, academics who would uh, introduce different ways how uh, timber is used in architecture. And uh, uh, besides that, uh, what we felt is really uh, important here as well uh, is this fact of translation. So we even had uh, one philosopher and um, language, uh, uh, how to call scientist, uh, to discuss uh, about translation, because what we also felt in our process, let's say it was a, it was a really large curatorial team, uh, uh, and we really felt that um, we uh, ourselves, also uh, from our backgrounds, needed to kind of um, translate these ideas and feelings about the topic. Uh, uh, the same, I think, felt uh, the, the practices, uh, and we will probably hear about that more today. Mm, so there were uh, acts of uh, translation in so many ways uh, uh, as the timber is translated uh, from a tree to a material for architecture, but the, the act of translation also of the ideas. Um, and um, uh, just to say maybe a few words about the practices as well, Sanchen can jump in. Uh, uh, we, uh, we thought uh, uh, that it would be yeah, very interesting uh, in the showcase to see all this, uh, so many uh, different ways uh, how this topic can be approached. Uh, so um, from the Estonian side, uh, we invited uh, uh, architects who deal with the topic uh, 
uh, very differently. Um, so that gives yeah an overall view uh, of the of the multiplicity of the topic. Yeah, when when Gillian and I were discussing, you know, who would who would we like to have involved, or who we think would be interesting and um, take on the subject, uh, we, we were in we were obviously interested in finding those that maybe hadn't exhibited a huge amount before. Um, so though the, the practices are, um, in general, are, are, I wouldn't say small practices. Um, some have emerged, some are emerging. Um, uh, and so that was really interesting for us. And we, we hope that it has provided an opportunity for, for, for them to, to sort of think about what they are doing and why they're doing it as well. So it was, it was a great opportunity to, to give um, people whose work we, we admire a chance to, to um, yeah, make something and um, consider things deeply. And uh, we're very thankful that you joined this journey, which uh, obviously haven't been a very easy one uh, because of uh, pandemic and uh, so many reasons. Uh, but uh, we are very amazed when we uh, came here on uh, Wednesday. Yeah? Uh, and so all these pieces coming together. So uh, we are so happy with the result uh, that we can see upstairs uh, later. Um, so, uh, actually, one um, maybe <laughs> a side comment, which you can also see upstairs, uh, is uh, there was, um, let's say, a, a small twist uh, by the curators to um, um, yeah, enrich this process. And uh, so we had an idea that we uh, uh, got these five boxes, because we had five pairs of uh, architects which were living uh, yeah, 3,000 kilometers apart. So, um, and we felt, you know, in this time of uh, pandemia that as these people will never meet, uh, but the, the timber topic, it's so material. How can they discuss uh, the topic and the ideas if they can't exchange anything uh, materially, like physically. They can only see each other in the Zoom windows and maybe exchange PDFs and emails. Uh, so yeah, we gave this extra opportunity um, uh, for those who wanted to use it to change the ideas in a physical form uh, in a transport box. And we um, poetically kind of enjoyed how these boxes then had these traces of this uh, long distance uh, on, on, on top of them as, as the material uh, might have, which is not from your backyard. Thanks. Yeah, or, I, I think probably we can, just to thank specifically Stephen from Roji Design for, the, for the, helping us with the exhibition, and also uh, Studio Studio, uh, Meek and Agnes in um, Tallinn, the graphic designers who, who did a really great job. Um, we like to thank um, yeah, I think uh, basically all the institutions behind it as well. Uh, uh, Belinda from Solstice and uh, all the installation team and uh, the engagement team. Um, and uh, from Estonia, all the project managers we have had during the time and Raul. Uh, and uh, the IAF, uh, Natalie, which we uh, saw virtually uh, so many times. Um, so, and of course the practices uh, who have done uh, so uh, great uh, jobs. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, and we are really looking forward to hear more now. <laughs>
and your presentation earlier on about Tara and the solstice, um, and indeed Newgrange. Um, without further ado, um, Rumor Inglis and uh, Hannigan Cook Architects are the first collaborators uh, that I'd like to welcome to the floor. And I think it's Damien and uh, maybe Lena, is it? Yep, great. And there'll be 15 minutes for this. Thank you. everyone, thank you for having us and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Damien Hannigan from Hannigan Cook Architects. This is Lena Lees from Rumor Inglis. The following presentation is a description of our joint contribution to this exhibit and it's entitled Conversation Piece. Uh, our focus has been to develop a method of design with an emphasis on existing context and the reuse of materials. By foregoing conventional architectural drawings, we hope to explore we, sorry, we hoped to explore the idea of an individual's interpretation as part of the design process. Is it possible that intentions which are lost in translation might represent greater flexibility and an increased capacity for the use of non-standard or found timber elements in a design? So, the images here show a hay barn in County Cavan, which Anna and I had been working on prior to beginning our collaboration with Rumor uh, The aim of this project was to convert the barn to residential accommodation, and some questions that we had been asking during the project included how best to use a building like this, is it useful as a structure or as an enclosure, uh, what can we learn from it in terms of its construction methods, could it be moved, for example? Can we build inside it? And if so, how might the new structure respond to the existing? The idea of that new addition inside the larger envelope was of particular interest to us and how offsetting that from what exists creates potential in-between spaces. So during our first conversation with Rumor Inglés, these questions and ideas were discussed and shared. Um, and Rumi Inglis uh, uh, responds with a typology of uh, Soviet that are called host barns, which is very widely spread uh, typology in Estonia and mostly abandoned. Um, and as our office is interested in empowering uh, communities through revitalizing spaces and reusing spaces, uh, this is the topic of uh, reusing the uh, barn in in Ireland was also very interesting for, for us. Um, as we were looking for similarities and differences in these typologies and in the context uh, of uh, where uh, us as architecture office were working in, uh, we reached an idea of interpretation. Uh, so we decided to work with text and describe uh, space uh, in words. Yeah, so the, the, just on the left-hand side also to say, th this was a reference that came up early in our conversation. Um, it was a series of drawings by Saul LeWitt uh, in which he would send instructions to a gallery and the gallery would carry out um, the, the, the instructions and uh, an artwork would be created. But the, the general... Um, concept was that the, the idea is the piece of art rather than the, um, the object. So th this was of interest to us at this point. Um, it, yeah, and to add, in our, our case, the focus was on the process because we were describing the process, not the end result itself. Uh, so uh, at, at that point, we agreed that the practical steps in this process would take the form of a, a written correspondence between our offices and that they would involve, um, one, the drafting and sending of a written set of instructions from one office to another, two, the interpretation of these instructions by the recipient using drawings, sketches, scale models, and one-to-one mock-ups, and three, 
the survey and analysis of the resulting object to inform the response and next iteration of the instructions. So the image on the right is a survey drawing showing the elements used in that first iteration of the instructions. So this became a, this became a kind of catalog of materials from which each subsequent iteration was built. Um, we thought that the recording and quantifying of the materials that we use was an important limitation for the, the process. And also it was important that just in keeping with the um, the kind of the room for interpretation and the lost in translation element that no author would share a drawn representation representation of their own instructions. Uh, so then this is um, the the first instructions that were sent from Hannigan Cook Architects to. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> this is the first instructions. Uh, sent by Hannigan Cook Architects to Rumor Inglés, um, and it, it gives an idea of the kind of the format of it. So uh, the top paragraph uh, describes a construction grid. The paragraph on the right, just below, outlines the assembly of the main structural element, which we thereafter call the primary component. You, you'll see upstairs in the gallery that um, primary component pops up on some of the instructions that are on the piece itself. Uh, the other paragraphs refer to details such as benches, shelves, cladding screens. Um, the image on the right then depicts Rumor Inglés' interpretation of these instructions in the form of a scale model. And uh, while sending each other these instructions or receiving them and thinking about these typologies that we uh, referred to earlier, we started to think about the life cycle of, uh, of the building materials. And uh, um, so we visited the wood recycling plant uh, near Tallinn and investigated the existing, uh, uh, the existing situation of reuse and, uh, and what we could work with. And uh, the result was uh, uh, sending uh, the box to Ireland uh, filled with uh, examples of uh, different materials found in the scrap belt from like really uh, precious uh, timber to really uh, wood chips. Mm. And this, this strongly affected the, the conversation uh, or the uh, work that continued. Mm. Yeah, I think um, so the image on the right, the image on the left here is the box leaving Estonia and the image on the right is it as, well, after the unpacking when it arrived in Ireland. But um, an important part at this stage in the process was that we, we were realizing that by taking account of the materials and kind of quantifying and recording what we have, just the knowledge of what's available um, makes the material usable. Uh, so irrespective of whether it's waste or, or um, new standardized off-the-shelf materials, it becomes usable once you have a, a kind of intimate knowledge of what's there to work with. Uh, so then on the right-hand side are, uh, of this slide are instructions 2.0 as sent by Rumor Inglés following their trip to the recycling center and our receipt of box one. And on the left-hand side is a one-to-one -one prototype of three of the primary components and some plywood benches between. Uh, th th this point marked the introduction of recycled materials in the artifact via a stipulation in Rumor Inglés's instructions that a percentage of pre-used elements be incorporated within the catalog of materials. Uh, you can see in the image that some of the shorter horizontal elements in the prototype are formed using sapil door frame. Uh, but the majority of the pieces are still standard off the shelf, three by twos and two by twos. Um, and then as part of the kind of the survey and the recording process, some notes resulting from this um, version related to its rigidity at full scale and the appropriateness of the section size that we used. And in further iterations of uh, the instructions, we experimented uh, or explored the possibility of uh, how to use the catalog of uh, already existing elements and how to uh, maybe not cut them into smaller pieces which uh, kind of uh, devaluates them. And then uh, here, in, here is an example of uh, experimenting with the primary components so that it can consist of uh, many smaller elements. Uh, 
and an example of uh, testing different a different layout, making the assembly easier or uh, more doable with uh, less uh, people building it? Yeah, so th just on that point, some of the previous iterations involved multiple primary components that had to be held in place and then made rigid by tying them all together. So this um, instance or this iteration allowed for uh, four freestanding corner units, which started to become almost furniture-like. Uh, so again, in the spirit of exploring similarities and differences and having seen where Rumeringle sourced their recycled materials, we were keen to see how we might do similar in Ireland. Uh, there are, of course, facilities like Dundeal or some salvage yards do exist, but um, nothing as comprehensive as the recycling centre that we saw um, uh, during one of our conversations. So. Um, in the case of the barn conversion in Cavan, Anna and I had already been talking about the possibility of using materials from existing derelict buildings on the farm itself. So on this slide, the image on the right-hand side shows an, an overlay of an historic map on a modern satellite image. And what becomes evident is that the parcel of land that's currently farmed by a single family was once inhabited by multiple generations of seven different families. And depending on the condition, the associated buildings, now often derelict, become potential material banks and sources of pre-used good quality timber. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you see a selection of timber pieces sourced from the derelict buildings identified in the previous slide. In the middle is a hand-drawn uh, quick survey catalog of the elements, same elements that were about to be put into that box. And on the right-hand side, uh, you see the materials arriving in Estonia and ready for incorporation within their version of the artifact. Uh, here is an example of with the next instructions. Uh, in Ireland, you were already testing out uh, the um, artifact inside an existing space. For example, here in the gallery, uh, we like referring to the first slide about the, the barn and your project building a house inside a house, or uh, a house inside a house in a shed, shed <laughs> as you said. Uh, we're already testing the, the rela relation to an existing uh, uh, shell. Hmm. Is it too late to start over? Just a joke. <laughs> I, one thing I forgot to say on the first slide was that the, so when we're talking about the artifact now, the artifact is the physical kind of representation or the manifestation of our conversation. So the artifact becomes a kind of object that everything that we're talking about during the correspondence is feeding into and feeding out of. So um, mm -hmm. Lena Lisa's reference to the artifact may not have been, may not have made sense because I failed to introduce it. Oh, another thing to say here is that this was the first time that we really got to lay out the grid and um, kind of test the grid lines relative to the existing building. So some of the things that we um, experimented with here was using the grid to template and cut bench and shelf um, pieces. Uh, and also, this was probably the point at which we decided that we had the most efficient primary component. Um, say anything? And here you can see uh, the result of same instructions uh, built in different countries. And, and we think that these pictures strongly represent like that uh, these uh, artifacts are the products of the environment. On the left-hand side, uh, the Irish, uh, Irish structure is mostly built of uh, new timber material uh, that will be reused after the exhibition, but the Estonian uh, uh, mock-up is uh, made uh, mostly out of uh, reused material. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, another thing to say here is just that we, so the, the instructions, um, the instructions are the, the conversation piece and the artifact is the product of it. So it, the, the, we were building these in parallel and the, so as you go upstairs to the gallery later, you'll see the Irish interpretation or the Irish version of the artifact. But 
we've been thinking about this in the sense that the instructions are sent back and forth, and this um, this artifact is assembled or demounted in these two locations. So it, it's kind of it's an idea which exists in the two countries, and there are similarities and differences relative to the environment that it's in. Uh, oh, this is an old slide. So. Um, the final set of instructions was uh, instructions 6.0. Uh, it was important from the outset that the idea of interpretation be tested as part of this work. So we enlisted three architecture students, Elizabeth, Irene, and Tien, and asked them to assemble the artifact using the most recent set of instructions 6.0. They received the instructions in advance so that they might become familiar with the format, but they were not shown any images of the previous iterations of the artifact. So as seen on the right-hand side, which you can't see, but there is an image of um, a kind of a stack of wood that arrived in the gallery on Monday morning. Go to the next slide, uh, yes. the next already. Uh, oh. Okay. So. That's the this, stack of wood on the right side? Yes. Okay, so that's the stack of wood as it arrived in the gallery on Monday morning. Uh, now, the other thing to say is this is a time-lapse video, but we've had some technical issues. Um, uh, but it does, it, it's available to view in the gallery upstairs. Now, as this was playing, our intention was to, to read a, a short paragraph concerning the ship of Theseus. I think it's still relevant. So. Um, the ship wherein Theseus and the youth of Athens returned from Crete had 30 oars and was preserved by the Athenians down even to the time of Demetrius Phalerius. For they took away the old planks as they decayed, putting in new and stronger timber in their places. In so much that this ship became a standing example among the philosophers for the logical question of things that grow, one side holding that the ship remained the same and the other contending that it was not the same. So if we take Saul Lewitt's assertion that the idea is a machine for making art, then buildings are a collection of materials held together by an idea. And it follows that, as with the ship of Theseus, if the idea is sufficiently strong, then the perceived value of the materials may not be so important. Or the value of an object is in the strength of the idea more so than the materials used to build it. Oh, we're missing. Mm, yeah, but the instructions were given to people who had never seen the uh, instructions or the object before, and we really got to test out the idea of uh, maybe, uh, maybe something gets lost in translation. And uh, to our surprise and delight, it did happen. So there is slight differences in the in the artifact in the gallery and the one uh, constructed in the barn. Um, but uh, to conclude, yes, um, we are thankful uh, for the experience uh, 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 because it's been a very special project to work uh, so closely with uh, Hannigan Cook Architects. In fact, almost 40 hours of uh, uh, international online meetings uh, and and. Uh, and on a such a inspiring project where we have so much freedom uh, to explore the topics that we are very inter interested in. And uh, not sure whether to thank uh, the organizers or the COVID for it lasting so long. Uh, but yeah, we've been uh, blessed to uh, witness some major life events during this uh, uh, period of time and that, that's quite exceptional. Yeah. I just echo all of that. Thank you very much for inviting us. Um, and yeah, so I, it, it's been a really wonderful experience. And I think, yeah, unless you've already been to the gallery and seen everything, I think you're all in for a, um, a really wonderful afternoon of timber things. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thank you. Can we just continue that conversation, Damien and Lena? That was wonderful. Really was. Um, really special. And
Can I say also, I know there wasn't too much shown of the finished piece, but it's a really interesting hybrid of chair, room, conversation, pit. It's really special and incredibly comfortable as well to sit in. So I would recommend you all go and take a little breather at some stage during the day to go up and see the, the very beautiful piece by Rumor Inglis and Hannigan Cook. Well done. Um, moving on next, um, I'd like to introduce Studio Quidas. And we have Maria, Henry, Hannes, and Andrea to introduce their piece. Dear ambassador, dear participants, organizers, curators, thank you for having us here. We are half of uh, Studio Cuidas Works. Cuidas uh, means uh, how in English. And um, as you saw already, probably upstairs, we are pretty much interested about clay. Yes, so a little about our background, uh, our collaboration. Uh, as a studio is not very old, probably the youngest here, around nine to ten months. And it started with, uh, with an exhibition as well. And uh, in, that, in, in that exhibition we were, put, uh, we were asked this very kind of uh, hard question, what are the houses that we need? And for architects it's a big question, like what is that the future needs? And this is how this is just to give a little bit of context to how we do things. Uh, so then during the process of thinking what is that the future needs, we kind of stumbled upon perhaps it's not a what, maybe it's a how. So we came upon the houses how we need. Yes. And in this exhibition, uh, around nine months ago, we first get in touch with a medium called clay and especially rammed earth. And, um, we define our um, kind of like um, situations that we are um, kind of like hands-on research uh, project. And uh, also in this exhibition, we think that we still try to understand, learn this medium. And uh, uh, we tried also different ways to say out our ideas in, con in context of this exhibition. Yes. But it reads back to the, to the clay. Yes. And now about this exhibition and our exhibit that is titled I Know This Room, I Have Walked on Its Floor. So first a little about our collaboration with the OGU architects. Um, we kind of uh, started off with uh, every week or every two weeks a presentation uh, to each other and we also worked uh, together on this kind of like a bigger board. Uh, but as they were teachers in the university, uh, they were kind of really helpful for us to trying to express ourselves as we're not as good as it, uh, as good um, at it. And they were asking these questions and giving us a lot of feedback and we were kind of speechless uh, about their like kind of uh, interaction with us. Uh, and that was very, very helpful for us trying to uh, understand what is it that we want to say. <laughs> um, and, but during our like, kind of collaboration, as the curator also mentioned, we came upon this kind of uh, formula, unique, standard, unique, and they kind of really uh, explained it as well. But uh, we came to the same conclusion that the tree in the forest is a unique um, kind of thing, and then it, through the sawmill it becomes standardized, and then um, in our kind of collaboration we were both very interested in the tactile qualities and in the marks of life that uh, wood kind of absorbs if it is exposed to life. So that was kind of uh, what we stated in our collaboration, yes. And uh, it's pretty clear for us that we gonna, our background is, uh, we are kind of like in between product design and architecture. Special design is our background, or interior design. So we decided to choose a small scale and um, it was pretty clear from the, in the beginning already that we're going to observe the wood. Uh, to observe the wood, uh, the tactile aspects, and it wasn't uh, clear which technology and, or how we do it. 
We had kind of like ideas that let's trace the wood uh, with pencils through the paper. Uh, and um, we, as Maria told already, that uh, we came to the formula that uh, during time, during the usage, uh, the wood changes unique. And, but how to translate this passing of time? It's a very again, like, important uh, issue or inspiring issue. How is uh, one family during uh, years or during decades or hundreds of years changing the wood and how by scratches and by legs, how um, users writing, basically writing uh, kind of like history of, the, um, history of the family or kind of like different uh, happenings, what uh, happened, the room or, or the space. And, um, we went to the high tech, tried to uh, use photogrammetry and then kind of like a digital scan and thought that maybe let's process the wood or kind of like observe, observe it very, very close. And, um, but somehow we didn't reach anywhere. And so we went uh, back to the... Yes, yeah, low tech, we tried different kind of methods to extract the top layer, but we were Kind of the biggest struggle was we were always stuck in the top layer as it is the most expressive kind of uh, part of the wood, but there is so much more in the idea. It is, uh, and we were stuck in how to show the passing of time, how to show the layers of time. And so, uh, or us was clear that we, we need to have kind of like a wooden floor uh, to observe. But uh, there was a, a long time a question, which floor to choose? And as um, curators here also told about translation, we quite directly, some or accidentally or directly, choose um, the family house of a uh, very well-known Estonian translator. And we, we may say that uh, this person was kind of like a very inspiring uh, person for us, especially all her uh, life, her way, how he described her life, and um, he translated to Estonian language many important writers like Hemingway, Salinger, Vonnegut, etc. And um, so um, uh, we decided to choose uh, her family house in the middle of Estonia, in Viljandima, and the wooden floor which were placed in the end of 19th century. Yes, so this is the exact layout of the floor you can also see upstairs. Um, it's over 100 years and a lot of generations have passed through it. Um, and then perhaps to the most important questions or to the elephant in the room, uh, why did we choose uh, rammed earth? And as I mentioned before, we were kind of like stuck in the top layer, but we had this question like, like how to like show time or how to put time into matter. And I guess anyone that has had connection with Ramder Ram projects, they perhaps know how time consuming it is and how heavy and how slow it is. And it's a process that uh, can't be hurried kind of it. Like you have to take your time and just go through all the steps. So we felt that it's kind of perfect matter for like what we want to say or like a perfect materialization of the passing of time, the slow process, the layers of time. Yes. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marie and Henry. That was wonderful, a real teaser as well. Um, it's almost edible, the, the, the pieces of ram that you've made upstairs. They're absolutely exquisite. And I was actually interested in the notion of formwork and the relationship of wood to clay and the type of formwork that you might pick, but that's for later on for our discussion, but well done. It's a, it's a very provocative piece as well. Um, the next uh, to speak is OGU Architects, and we have Chris and Rachel here to introduce their piece. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Chris from OGU Architects. Hi, and I'm Rachel. 
I'm much louder than Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Rachel from OGU Architects. Thank you so much for having us today, and thank you for the opportunity of being in such an incredible collection of work. Um, so we were partnered from the beginning with Quidas Works, who just presented. And um, we'll start with this picture, which is uh, on the left, uh, Estonia, and on the right, Belfast. And you can see that the difference between the two lies heavily in the boundaries and the fences between, which we'll come back to. Believe it or not, this is a picture of Hannes. <laughs> he looks very different today. But his initial presentation was about beekeeping and being involved with bees. And a lot of the initial presentations and talks that we were having as a wider group were about control and standardization of timber. And for us, there was this parallel conversation happening about attitude to the ecosystem of which we are part, or nature, and how people have different level of control that they wish to exert over their surroundings. And in terms of keeping bees, there has to be an element, I, if I understand this rightly, of you have to relax. You can't control them. They, they go around and they, they come back. But you can nurture and you can participate in that process. And the other thing that became really interesting to us was that you start to become aware through processes of involvement of other time cycles. So an annual cycle, a seasonal cycle, the cycle of bees moving around and coming back. And um, the parallel conversations between the way we think about timber and the way we think about our role in that ecosystem were incredibly interesting to us. And so we became increasingly obsessed with people who have maybe alternative or unusual, uh, unusual attitudes to control or not control with their uh, nature around them, the things they're growing, people who maybe nurture what other people consider to be weeds, or in contrast, people who feel the need to have almost design out unpredictability entirely and where that, that comes from. So we put out a call uh, via various channels, online and through word of mouth, wanting to talk to people and visit people who felt that they had a different way of looking at gardening and nurturing things that grow. And we discovered a couple of things through this process. The first one was that even though we went through a lot of different channels, and we thought we'd found a completely random scattering of people across Northern Ireland. Uh, it became apparent over time that they all knew each other, and they were all friends. <laughs> and the second thing that we realized is that um, every time we came to visit one of these people, this attitude towards uh, nurture and wanting to rescue and maybe not having to have total control was becoming also embodied in the kind of structures that they were making for themselves to operate out of. So the garden structures and the lean-tos were always uh, unique and a little bit different and a kind of world that you weren't expecting. And this threw a light on a sharp contrast between this kind of garden structure, if you go back one slide, and a very neat and actually quite mean timber structures you often get in the form of the garden sheds. And how ironic it was that there's this huge industry of garden sheds that aren't particularly kind to trees. They don't necessarily recognize trees and the life behind them. And they certainly don't think about renewal and reuse. They're kind of one time, almost disposable object eventually. And it's very difficult to, to work with them. And in further conversations with Quidus, we both, we're from Belfast, we're based in Belfast. And there were parallels coming out in our conversations in terms of we're both from places that have tension in, in our pasts. Um, and we certainly have noticed in Belfast, there's maybe, um, it, you want to comment on this as well, but there's, there's, not everybody wants to raise their head above the parapet and there's a kind of not wanting to be super loud in your surroundings and your home and the way you present yourself necessarily, draw attention to yourself for obvious reasons? I think there is, we find these little sort of 
subtle little instances around the place, and then we started to find that they were manifesting themselves sort of around the corner in these little timber structures, and we Quiet. started to explore those. Acts of rebellion, and people were sort of quietly rebelling against the system and, and control in their own little ways with having a wild hedge in front of the house or having an unusual collection of animals that you wouldn't expect. And there's a history in Belfast that goes, goes back of people having elephants in their yards and things like that uh, during the wartime, which is really interesting once you get into it. Jason, who uh, whose structure this is, has all sorts of amazing, interesting plants. Whether he's allowed to have them or not, we're not sure. <laughs> we don't ask questions. <laughs> um, and we were finding the same thing, and this is a photo that was sent back to us from Guida's chat in our conversations of a structure built for, for pigeon keeping, and this same kind of quiet rebellion escape uh, and, and building a world around yourself to, to do that. And actually what we found is that the further you go into Belfast, the more the urban structure kind of supports that because the terrace houses, the yards behind are very secretive and not widely overlooked. And you can build your lean-to or your shed without having to worry about how that appears to neighbors and other people. So quite often, although the front's kind of uniform and there's a lot of um, preening and gardening, out the back is often a world of, of quite surprising lean-tos and structures and, and plants and gardening and biodiversity for that matter. And what was increasingly obvious was timber was allowing these worlds to be created. The nature of timber, the easy cut and fix of timber, the way that you can buy some tools and, and have a go meant that it was always the material. I, every time we went to one of these places and the, the attitude to uh, nurture or your role in nature being embodied in these structures, it was timber. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, first of all, it's the, the machinery isn't super expensive that you need and, and it doesn't have to be perfect. But secondly, if you're drawn to rescuing things and nurturing things, there are layers of meaning that build up in older pieces of timber and putting them together uh, create something richer uh, and, and more meaningful to people if they're creating worlds. And then on top of that, the thing about timber, and this was really driven home to us by our partners, is that the marks of use and the way it demonstrates how it's been worked, it reminds you of these different time cycles that we were talking about at the beginning in terms of annual cycles, cycles of maintenance, cycles of daily use, all making their mark and showing their themselves in, in the timber and giving it a different quality and a different uh, meaning. You'll probably see that in, in our structure as well, where we're trying to select which bits that we allow the story to be still told and, and trying to make a kind of practical enclosure. Um, so it's something to sort of explore where the, where the bits are left and where um, sort of stories, the new stories are, are made as well. So this is uh, one of the rubbings, one of the tracings that were sent to us by, by Quidas Works. And you can see we were taking photos at the same time and becoming interested in the stories that Timbo was telling us and how you can trace those back and, and kind of uh, mine for, for further stories from, from the pieces, even if you don't know if you don't think you know that much about them, actually, if you take the time, you can find out more than you think. And so what we started doing was trying to find ways of representing through drawing. And hand drawing is another thing that we were very inspired by our partners through and challenged ourselves to keep working that way because of the, the truth about the materials that comes through and the marks that you leave. But uh, looking at the different cycles, uh, time cycles that the, the timber pieces were telling, telling us about. So this is one about the cycle of daily use in Jason's uh, shed, one of the people we were talking to and how that traces its marks out on the floor and trying to find a way of representing that in a drawing that kind of also makes marks and leaves traces behind. And another cycle we were very interested in in terms of what timber can tell us is not just the cycle of use as it is now in its current position, but also it can tell us where it was before and a whole other life that it has had. So this is a screen in somebody else we were talking to uh, 
Lawrence Street workshop, and part of the room is made of a screen from the Ulster Hall. So it has a variety of chair scrapes and graffiti on it. Something nice about God and something horrible about the king on that one. <laughs> this is a drawing that was shared with us again that we fell in love with, which is a drawing of shed building with pieces of timber in it. And again, even the way that timber layers up and is maintained and patched and repaired tells you about these cycles of maintenance that these timber buildings require. If you love them, you can make them last a long time by doing this. So what was coming out of this conversation was that although reuse of timber in the garden structures is a common theme, actually um, the nature and that there's a difference between our two places and the reuse of timber has very different forms in the two places. And that's because of the way that in Estonia and the examples that we were being shared, the planks, the cladding planks that have a robustness and a thickness and they're almost designed that you can take them off and reuse them again. They can take some punishment. Whereas, as we have said, the garden sheds and structures that we often see in an eye, uh, they, they don't have that capacity. They wouldn't even stand being disassembled. And so these cladding planks after the shed comes down, in Estonia, have a, there's a market for it, and you can buy it and reuse it, and that's quite wonderful. Whereas in Belfast, it's the components that have the robustness for reuse. And so we have a very different language of reuse in garden structures, which in the past we've, we've maybe taken for granted or not, been, not found particularly lovely. But the more you get into it, there's a humor and a magic to it. There's a kind of loveliness to seeing a building component used in the wrong way um, that we, we started to really love and, and enjoy. But there's also a human story around what was happening and, you know, there's a certain type of person who recycles these types of timber and these pieces. And so um, we were really lucky in working with Joe Lafferty um, sorry. Yeah. and, and mm -hmm. finding um, our subjects. And Joe has uh, done an amazing sort of photographic study of both the people and the structures using 35 uh, mil uh, film medium format film, which it felt, uh, aside from taking absolutely beautiful photographs, which is already down to how talented Joe is as well, it has, there's a truth to that medium format film. It's slightly grainy and it talks about the materials that are used in the process of making the picture, which felt particularly appropriate to um, this set of portraits, which are part of our exhibition in a book upstairs. And then other cycles, time cycles, that we were trying to talk about in our installation that you'll find are drawings about, for example, this one is Lawrence Street Workshop and the different locations of the different components that have come together to make their building. And then we traced the story of part of their building, which had been made of pitch pine elements that had come from the general post office building, now demolished in the center of Belfast. And so we traced the cycles of forestry behind that and how the pitch pine forests um, have evolved in, in North America, which is where those elements came from. These are all uh, explained more in the exhibit upstairs. But the point is, the more we started tracing the stories of components and talking to the people who nurture and rescue and, and know things about them, the more devastating it is to think that um, these windows were on the skip pile after hundreds of years of growing, coming all the way across the world, being worked carefully, and then having the only value to them was that um, they're expensive to throw away. Um, we, we actually had to, because we couldn't take all of them in our Volkswagen Golf, as you might imagine, um, we actually had to buy the ones that we, um, we've used in the exhibition. Um, could, because the only value they had was the ability to take them away for free. That's what the contractor wanted. And being, being replaced with PVC ones. And it, the, it always seems sad, but after you start thinking about the stories and, and value other than monetary and, and where things have come from, uh, it, it's really extremely sad to, to see those go to, to the skip. So our exhibition is made out of these windows, largely.
And um, we're very lucky um, in that we have a workshop in, uh, in the bottom of our building, so it allowed us to make the structure. So th that was a really kind of lovely thing for us to be able to, um, I suppose, get into, try on somebody else's shoes in terms of how you might make something. I mean, obviously, you can't um, totally um, deny your sort of <laughs> architectural education, but um, it was just nice to sort of try making something in a different way and playing around with timber, you know, having that really tactile quality, choosing, you know, which faces might, have, um, might need to be planed and standardized, which stories would be left, where, where the marks of use would remain. And so it was fun to sort of work in this kind of accretive kind of way and maybe not quite as planned a way as we might normally work through drawings and, and the sort of tendering process. And there's a, the, the way of making these structures lends itself to something that has to be disassembled and then put back together in different places. Like, the, um, uh, we're always drawn to covering over the screws and, and trying to almost hide all of that away, but this is a completely different way where you, you're reading how something has been put together. If you go to the allotments or you go to some of the people we've talked to, the, the kind of the joy is seeing exactly how it's been put together and how you could alter and adapt it. And we wanted to keep that in this structure for practical reasons, but also because there's a joy in being able to work those things out. Um, and so we, we were trying to evoke, obviously, the, the feeling of being in a potting shed with the structure in terms of the scale and the, the elements of it. That was part of it. Yeah, and hopefully it has some sort of atmosphere um, that, I mean, it's not exactly like something that might be sitting in a, um, in a garden somewhere, but it has something of that atmosphere and quality, hopefully, through this sort of process. And hopefully some of the humor in the bits and pieces that we've pulled in and thinking where they might go. But then um, the other part of it is that if you go to an allotment in winter, there are all these little glass houses that are locked away and the things inside them aren't growing or maybe they're just bare or there aren't many leaves and it feels almost a little bit like um, cabinet, display cabinets. And there's a kind of sadness to that in winter, but there's a kind of a sadness to that kind of structure and feeling of a cabinet as well, in terms of this is a particular moment in time, we're remembering this for, for historic purposes. I think we wanted to evoke a little bit of that as well in the structure, just to say these components, these elements are special, and there, you know, there aren't lots of them, and we're, set, we're not using windows like this a lot anymore. So this is a particular moment in time where you can go on to, uh, gum tree or wherever and find a huge stack of uh, Sapili windows. It's unbelievable and something to be taken quite, it's quite special and to, to take it seriously. So the, the final side here, I think um, Raoul used a word earlier which was gratitude and we were trying to think and reflect earlier on what, what have we learned through this process and what are we trying to bring forward. And I think it's that missing ingredient a lot of the time that maybe we don't recognize we need if we're trying to think about the environment and sustain, more sustainable ways to practice. Uh, this idea of gratitude and remembering where the pieces have come from and um, honoring that somehow is something we, we haven't talked enough about before as a practice, but moving forward, I, I think we definitely will. So thank you. Thanks everyone. Um. What a beautiful presentation, really exquisite, and that relationship between informality and ingenuity. I don't think I'll ever look at a garden shed again in the same way. <laughs> so I beg the tour of the Belfast sheds with Rachel and Chris. You betcha. Um, just a short anecdote on that, if I may. I know Chris Boyle is in the audience, and Chris will relate to this. A, a fellow colleague of ours, Peter Cody, uh, bought himself a beehive and it was a Japanese beehive made from a particular Japanese larch. And what he thought was really special about the kit of parts, you get it in pieces, like an inventory of things, that the bees will only go between eight and 10 millimeters of a joint. If it's any smaller, they won't use it. If it's any bigger, they won't use it either. So it has to be incredibly precise. So there is that beautiful relationship, I think, between precision and informality. And I think your piece upstairs talks to that as well. But, uh, 
congratulations, it's a really, really beautiful piece. Um, the last speaker before we break for lunch is Paco Ullman and Kaja Pei, and uh, I might introduce them to the floor. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's a really pleasure to be here. I would like to especially thank uh, all the organizers and also especially the curators. It's all the process has been a real pleasure for us. Uh, my name is Kaya Baer. Uh, he's Paco Ullman. And uh, we uh, collaborated with uh, Joseph uh, McKay Architects. Uh, and we exchanged ideas about um, uh, the different aspects, how memory is translated into wood or how wood can actually be the carrier of uh, memory. Uh, but uh, Joseph will uh, present his uh, work later. Uh, basically, we had uh, two uh, starting points. At first, uh, we were really curious about the properties of wood. Uh, often we tend to use materials like uh, some sort of abstract material which uh, natural uh, uh, properties are somehow suppressed or, or rather avoided. Uh, you probably know works by Ahim Mengels who is uh, working in Stuttgart University and he's thinking a bit in the same direction. He has uh, studied for example, how the humidity or the expansion, uh, wood expansion due to the humidity could be rather used for the design idea and not suppressed. Uh, and uh, our second starting point was uh, how to use uh, wood in a, a bit unexpected environment <clears throat> where we are not used to see it. <laughs> so, uh, the properties of uh, wood. We especially were interested in this uh, aspect of memory. Uh, if uh, wood can be understood as a, some sort of information device. Um, you all uh, know that uh, by counting these uh, wood rings, it is possible to determine the age of the uh, tree, sure. Uh, but there is also the uh, method of uh, Trento chronology. Uh, which uh, makes possible to, if we have unknown sample of wood, uh, we can actually determine the exact year when it was felled and also obviously when it started to grow. Uh, the specialists of Tendro Chronology, they have uh, known samples and by using this uh, ratio of the uh, wood rings, uh, uh, it is possible, uh, while um, comparing it with the unknown sample, it is possible to understand uh, exactly the year of when it started to grow and when it was uh, felled. Um, as you know, every summer is different, and that is the reason why every wood ring is basically different. And uh, the ratio is due to this reason uh, different. Uh, my friend uh, renovated the house a couple of years ago and he discovered really old looking beams in this house. And uh, we went uh, with these samples to the endochronologist uh, to determine uh, how old this wood actually is. And uh, he determined that uh, this uh, wo uh, tree must have been felled in uh, 1782. And uh, close to this, uh, my friend's house, there used to be once a manor house, which was dismantled in 1920s uh, and reused as a building material. So it obviously, uh, the beams were from this uh, manor house. So uh, wood carries some sort of uh, specific fingerprint to trace the history of the buildings which is uh, really interesting and it's so, so simple. And moreover, one of the trees uh, was, uh, while felled, the age was 
320 years, so it must have been started, it's growing in, uh, nine, in 1462. So you can imagine this crazy uh, time span. It, uh, they had just uh, discovered uh, or invented the printing press and America wasn't discovered yet. So this is something really charming that wood can, in a way, unite the different uh, generations. Uh, but uh, beside uh, saving this uh, weather information, wood also saves another kind of information. Obviously, the close impacts, if uh, there have been fire, for example. But it actually, <laughs> it comes out that even, it even uh, can uh, save the information of the supernova explosions. A couple of years ago, it was uh, discovered that uh, the traces of supernova explosions manifest themselves as a higher concentration of uh, carbon-14 isotopes in uh, spatial growth rings. So, as I said, it was discovered just a couple of years ago. So this really simple material wood is actually full of surprises and maybe we are yet to discover its potential as an information device. Um, so, in the, like, while doing the workshop, the Woodworks workshop uh, a year and, I don't know, a few months ago, um, we were thinking about, okay, if we're talking about the memory of wood, um, uh, what happens uh, when the, we cut, cut that uh, uh, um, tree down and use it somehow? So, it, uh, for us, it's like very important to understand that uh, the wood, uh, it, it, its ability to record, record activities, history, stories is uh, still ongoing. So, in uh, in that sense, you can cut it. But yeah, you can cut it. Oh, it work. Come here. Okay. <laughs> you can cut it, but it still continues to say the information. <laughs> yes. So, in uh, coincidence, uh, at the same time, I was uh, clean up, cleaning up my grandfather's apartment and I found his old uh, drawing table. And so, we, we had this, uh, which has really interesting traces uh, from uh, many, let's say, two generations of architects uh, doing drawings on, on, that, on that table. So, we, we had an idea to use it somehow. So, Paco was really modest, but it was actually his grand-grandfather to whom uh, belonged the table uh, at first. And so, the four generations of architects have actually used this table to do their drawings. <laughs> yes. So, um, so uh, we had this, this idea to somehow uh, do this archaeological uh, digging around the table and uh, see what we can find. And, uh, to clean it up, uh, to somehow uh, bring uh, forward these uh, markings that are interesting and, uh, uh, and somehow trace them. Uh, we had a lot of uh, ideas how to do that and a lot of uh, tinkering around uh, what, kind of, um, uh, paint, uh, what kind of paints, what kind of methods do we use. So, uh, but the end, the end, uh, uh, we started just carving out everything that is like um, the markings that are uh, uh, seemed important, and and then filling it up with um, I don't know what was the material in the end. The fluorescent paint. Fl fluorescent paint. So uh, so there are also a lot of uh, uh, experimentation with that uh, to to end up and uh, give this. Uh, the picture of these activities on the table and uh, what what has been done there. So it's really interesting to see, like on the size of the table, there are uh, you, where the architects have put their pins in, so to connect the, the, the paper firmly on the table, and also the toes of the table legs are are uh, really messed up because it's uh, I don't know maybe they were very nervous at one point I don't know. But it's a, it's an interesting interesting notion. So it's a kind acts like a kind of a, a archaeological finding or a, <laughs> a digging place that you can like reinterpret this um, what what has been up there done there. Mm -hmm. 
And now we come to the second part of our project to uh, how to translate uh, this uh, mnemonic, mnemonic properties or this memory uh, properties of wood into some sort of environment. And uh, which it would be a bit unexpected. Uh, and and um, uh, we came to the uh, Soviet uh, modernist housing areas, uh, which were uh, built in uh, 60s, 70s and 80s, and actually 30% of Estonians are living in this kind of areas. They are highly criticized. Uh, um, they tend to lack uh, all kind of uh, small scale and human human touch elements and uh, and also the layers of history and that was the point where we tried to make the attachment to this uh, memory properties of wood uh, we looked for the uh, small scale objects which would be hand touched or uh, some sort of uh, potentially comfortable or human scale uh, um, uh, spaces where to use uh, the wood and uh, and these are the uh, three examples we worked with and, uh, so as we ident identified some interesting places we found in Lastama which is in Tallinn and uh, it's uh, there are some hints about uh, people wanting to have some kind of uh, more humane uh, mm, touches or humane, humane. Uh, so there are some hints that people want to uh, somehow use it um, uh, more, uh, not just a handrail or a, there's a, somebody has put a chair there, somebody has painted a uh, side of the wall. So, so there are different kinds of uh, uh, possibilities. So we had this idea to use wood as something uh, as a um, as a memory device and uh, some kind of design or put a, this massive wooden object that uh, is uh, the people uh, are designing themselves by using it. So it's so it's uh, at, uh, from it's the, the, as time takes on the the um, it, it is formed by touches and uh, markings and and uh, all, all the weather. So it's something that is uh, aging quite uh, with, with, this, uh, with the newly built city. So, uh, so there are different kinds of like a corner, like a staircase, like a handrail. So different, different, different options in that. So, uh, as you can see, we took a bit uh, poetical or quite um, abstract uh, approach. Uh, perhaps these things are not to be seen as uh, uh, technical drawings, <laughs> but rather as uh, symbols to uh, evoke the ideas. And uh, as Bok already said, that uh, in case of this kind of object, we see this uh, natural wear of the wood, so rather something that is uh, intentional. Uh, and uh, while humans are touching it uh, and uh, the wood is wearing it, uh, it's like uh, revealing the whispers or this uh, supernova explosion traces from the wood. And uh, also making these new scratches uh, into the material is, uh, can be seen as a writing, uh, our potential common future. So um, uh, that's how we, we see the applying of these um, uh, memory uh, properties. And uh, to conclude it, uh, I said already that the uh, table belonged to Paco's um, grand-grandfather and uh, then grandfather, uh, who were really well-known Estonian architects. And Paco's grandfather, Alan Murdma, actually made some drawings of these uh, modernist building areas on this table. Uh, that was also a link we had. Uh, the um, uh, Mark Foster Cage, 
uh, who, is, uh, who was the former dean of uh, Yale Architecture School, has said that architecture is not a crime and it doesn't need a justification. Uh, Gage works with the aesthetics of the architecture. Uh, we tend to think about this modernist area as some sort of crime. <laughs> and you obviously, you know that the crime scenes are investigated using UV light because blood is fluorescent. Uh, so you, we, are, we all uh, welcome you to uh, have a look at this table and to switch in the UV bulbs if they are not yet in and then to investigate uh, this table and all these marks done by architects and find out if architecture is crime and does it need a justification or not. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Kaya and Paco. Um, I don't think I'll ever look at my desk the same again. The blood, sweat and tears of an architect's table is frightening at times. But uh, what a wonderful piece and the last name I link with the blocks and your incremental uh, pieces are absolutely wonderful. I'm looking forward to discussing that further with you this afternoon. Uh, maybe just a few housekeeping matters. We're about to break for lunch. It's now five to one. Um, we might start a little bit later after lunch at half past one to be back here. I know Shelley and Yvonne are listening to us uh, via Zoom and they will be joining us not in person but on Zoom at 1.30 and they'll be staying on hopefully for the discussion after that. Um, the event has been recorded just so that everybody knows and it's been recorded for the Solstice, the Irish Architecture Foundation, and for our Estonian partners for sharing on social media. Um, just to say, the gallery is open throughout the day, and if people want to visit over lunchtime, um, you may, it's, it's all the pieces, and I'd encourage you all to spend a little bit of time with the pieces so far, and indeed, what we're going to see this afternoon. Uh, lunch is being provided by the Solstice for everybody here, and it's in the foyer. Very grateful to Belinda and her team, Deirdre, Paula, Nell, and everybody else here. Um, so I look forward to having you all back at 1.30. Thank you very much. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the keynote speakers for this afternoon, uh, Shelley McNamara and Yvonne Farrell of Grafton Architects. Um, Shelley was very formative in my own education. She taught me in second year and fifth year and left a deep mark, a very good mark, with fluorescent infill and all. Um, a, a wonderful architect and we're very blessed to have them. And I know Ger Carty, their director, is in the audience as well. Welcome, Ger. Um, so I might leave the floor to Shelley and Yvonne if you're ready, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Um, Yvonne and I are very sad we can't be there physically today. We were really looking forward to it and we're delighted Jar can attend. And we, we put up this image because we're working quite a lot remotely at the moment. And one of our architects sent us this image as a reference for a project we're working on at the moment. And it made us smile. It just came in last Wednesday and we thought maybe it would make you smile too. But it's, it's also quite uh, relevant and um, one could talk about it, but I'm not going to talk about it. I just want to say before we start, we're not surprised this exhibition is happening in Salsters because of Belinda. Belinda has an innate understanding of architecture and was fantastic for us to work with when Jar and Yvonne and I and the team were working on uh, this building. And it's, it's wonderful that um, Solstice has teamed up with the Architecture Foundation. And it's wonderful that there's a, an event like this happening in an art centre where the audience goes beyond architects, which is what we feel we all um, need. And it was such a pleasure to listen to <clears throat> the architects this morning. And so great because we don't know any of them, whether they're Irish or from 
Estonia, but their passion and their um, skill and the, the beauty of their presentations was, was a real tonic on a, a Saturday morning. And of course, having Peter as chair, which kind of oozes charm and um, and grace and intelligence. So it looks like it's a wonderful event that we are, we are missing. Anyway, um, could we go to the next image, Yvonne? Yvonne is driving the, the presentation. We're, we're going to focus on our first all timber building, which is not this one, um, which is in Arkansas. But as a lead into this, we just want to talk about some lessons or investigations we've done in the last number of years in relation to timber construction, because we've been trying for a while to be able to make an all timber building. And many architects in the room probably did this competition for a new embassy, Irish embassy in Tokyo. And um, one of the things we discovered in looking into structure and Chinese and Japanese cultures is this thing called reciprocal structures. And I have to say, we became kind of obsessed with the reciprocal structure. But the thing that we've learned in working in, in different places over the years is uh, the relationship between culture and construction. And that really came clear this morning, I think in, in Natalie's introduction and in many of the uh, presentations. It's something we really like about this new kind of movement of Baukultur and the Davos Declaration where they talk about construction is culture, that it's not, that they're not separate things because construction is always considered to be um, the thing that builds the cultural artifact, but actually the way of building, it's a, it's a kind of language. Uh, it is a language. So um, what, what we felt in looking at this reciprocal uh, structure used by the Chinese and Japanese since the 12th century, but also used in um, buildings such as the Chapter House in Lincoln Cathedral and uh, by Leonardo da Vinci in the making of a bridge. And what we love about it is that it's, it's, it gives the ability of making um, large spans with uh, small elements. And it's something we've become really um, interested in uh, the, the, the versatility of timber and how timber is different to uh, other materials and to uh, concrete, let's say. And Yvonne, maybe go to the next image. So what the, the, the other thing we found was that it sounds kitschy, but um, the reciprocal, the spiraling three-dimensional kind of weave, um, which builds up to a kind of momentum, you could say, um, that it has this Bridget's Cross uh, formation and the four hands are four grafting hands where we were testing lifting somebody very heavy uh, with our hands interlocked in the way that um, the reciprocal elements do and how efficient it is. And looking at Katsura and the wonderful drawing in the middle, the wonderful weave of Katsura and thinking about the reciprocal structure as being a, a version of that, let's say. But the thing that, that we really loved about it is the kind of symbolic quality because of this being an embassy, that it's got interdependency and uh, overlap, and that perhaps that would reflect the, the, the use of the building. What's also really interesting is that there's a lot of beams, but not a lot of columns, because the interlocking system, like a space frame, I suppose, but it, 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 it has, it's a wonderful thing to work with. It has no axis, no primary, no secondary. It has this three-dimensional quality. Next image. And um, again, I suppose one of the things that, doing this competition is the whole dilemma of climate and the fact that Japanese is, Japan is seismic. And the weak point, let's say, of the reciprocal structure is that if one connection changes, it's less, like a house of cards and it collapses. So it's probably not a great structure to use in, unless you're Chinese or Japanese and really know how to do it, to use in a seismic um, context. But it, it also, the thing of rain in, in Japan is, we, we watched that film, um, Kagamusha in the office, a wonderful film with these extraordinary 
timber buildings and we were trying to make something which would have that kind of weight and heft and would pick up that kind of cultural nuance. Next image. And we tried this again in another competition for School of Architecture in Liverpool. And in this case, we made the reciprocal structure single story. And the top right hand sketch is the roof plan where all the little tiny squares were imagined as being roof lights. And the other drawings are to do with the fact that you could have diagonal movement or uh, orthogonal movement. And we thought this was a wonderful um, environment to have a school of architecture, that it has that sense of being able to be open or to be one place or to be a series of, of different places. And the next image is a competition we did during COVID, actually the second or third competition we did during COVID in uh, South Korea. And we won a project for a new school in South Korea, um, which is a fantastic project and it's just starting on site. And we found the Koreans fantastic to work with and we have really interesting partners there. So we, we, we entered this um, competition again. We discovered when we were doing the school that even though so many of the beautiful buildings of uh, Korea uh, were built in wood, that um, Korea through all its wars and other disasters uh, lost its, uh, its uh, trees, its woods, a bit like Ireland. And um, so they don't build in timber anymore very much and it costs a lot of money and they're starting to try and repair, recuperate the, the forests. But it, it, that that that's also comes home very strong that that, that the political and economical um, forces, uh, as well as climatic forces, affect the choice of wood. Here we're using it; it it's on a, a concrete plinth, and it's these lightweight boxes of space which are the exhibition spaces for this uh, new museum in a new town. It was also an exercise in how to uh, clad wood. Uh, that it wouldn't be exposed externally, how, could, how you could clad it and at the same time make it feel like a timber building. Next image. And then the whole thing of the relationship between inside and outside and always capturing landscape and trying to capture the atmosphere of the place that you're working in, even if you're using the same material, that there's that there's a, a, a kind of a dreamy atmosphere in many of the buildings that we looked at in Korea that we were trying to capture in, in this um, world. Next image. And closer to home, this is a distillery uh, building we're doing in County Kerry, and this is the still room. And um, it, it's, it's uh, model studies of us trying to, it has to be very tall because of the stills. So it's a nine meter high glass wall, uh, not a very big roof span. But it's an exercise in trying to, again, build a uh, big space quite simply uh, with small materials which build up to having a structural stability and the uh, structure of the roof working to hold up the structure of the wall. Also trying to avoid using window frames and to somehow find a way of cladding this uh, where, where we're not using uh, window systems, let's say. We should say that this model and the models to come of the Arkansas project made by a student of uh, Peter's from Saul, James Kennedy, who's a um, fantastic uh, model maker. Um, so the next image takes us to Arkansas. Um, the, 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 the brief for this project and the role of the project, I know I presented this at the launch, so some of you will have seen this, um, but we're going to really show, I suppose, how it has developed since, um, I can't remember when the presentation of the launch of this um, exhibition was. But um, this, is a, an, this project is um, a fabrication uh, space, teaching space, not here, now the building we're doing. Um, and it's, it's um, the, the, the aspiration is that it would be a tool uh, for teaching and will be part of the uh, School of uh, Architecture, the Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design in uh, Arkansas. The brief was fascinating because they said, we seek a building that is redolent of the qualities of the forest, one that imagines a new timber and wood as materials. We seek a building that is hewn, carved, wo uh, jointed, woven, 
and assembled, layered and laminated. And we thought, my goodness, how do we do that? It also said that Arkansas's identity is one of deep pragmatism that appreciates poetic beauty. And this balance is embedded in the vision of what is called the Anthony Timberland's Centre, as the sponsor. So the elements we were looking at as reference, the top two images on the left are from our teaching in Mendrisio. The top left is John Caminada, uh, his work, which our students were drawing at one-to-one, uh, -one. and the tree is where we, um, Yvonne has a passion about trees and the structure of trees below ground and how the structure of trees can inform the structure of uh, buildings. And it's, it's, uh, it's an amazing, amazing things we've discovered about how the trees operate, have a whole other world below ground as well as above ground. And then we were looking at the informal uh, barns of the states and Ozark. This one is in Delaware. Uh, these industrial buildings, which have a casual, informal kind of quality. I suppose the John Caminata uh, buildings have an amazing weight. And then there's this Anthony, um, sorry, there's the Thorncrown Chapel on the right hand side by the architect Faye Jones, who was a really important architect in the School of Architecture, is called After Him. And we just found this uh, chapel extraordinary. And it's influenced by Saint-Chapelle, uh, as well as by Frank Lloyd Wright, with whom um, Faye Jones worked. It's built in the 80s. It looks like an external space, but it's internal. It has loads of windows, something like 500 windows. It's actually air-conditioned and heated, but it feels outside. And we just thought that was an amazing thing, that you might make something light and maybe also have something heavy. Next image. And our early studies were to do with um, uh, the climate, the fact that it rains throughout the year and there are really heavy showers, and that we would use the uh, gutters as beams, uh, primary structure for the support of the roof of the uh, production um, shed, and that that production shed would climb up uh, the five, six, seven storeys of the teaching uh, uh, block which relates to the main street. Next image. And uh, even though the, they almost meet, the, the, they almost close, the, that joint between the dancing roof and the vertical block, from an educational point of view, we really wanted that connection that even if you get a tiny glimpse from the very top of the building to the ground, that that was important educationally. And we were looking at all the different woods and what wood would be really heavy um, ranging from oak to um, ash to, Yvonne is going to go through this in more detail, but it was the lightness of the wood and the, uh, of the roof perhaps, and the purple columns are the ones that are taking a uh, heavy, heavy load. Next image. Because one of the challenges was that there's an 18 meter span uh, in the middle of this building, which has to carry uh, this lifting crane, so it's really heavy weights. So that was a real, and, and we didn't want to break that span. And we we've hung the lecture theatre from above because the lecture theatre we felt should be and they wanted immediately overlooking this fabrication yard. So this Queen Post Trust was used to ties the beams of the upper level and allows us to hang the um, the lecture space. And Yvonne is going to go through that in in more detail. Next image. Um, the main street or road is to the right-hand side of that plan, uh, the um, Martin Luther King uh, Boulevard. It's really a road more than a street, but that's the public edge. And the top image shows how we've opened up this window to the street and the footpaths so that when people walk by, that they would be able to look into this fabrication yard. And you can see the hanging lecture theatre uh, from the Queen Post Trust above. Next image. All the roof lights face north because it's really, really hot in the summer. It's really humid and it snows in the winter and it rains a lot. So it's, it's quite a, um, a lot of things to think about. But what um, uh, we, we, we found that that thing of, of discovering the, the real uh, qualities of, of, of timber and the, the fact that, um, that we can uh, combine different woods uh, the, the hardwoods and the softwoods to make this kind of environment. Next image. And then this building has a civic uh, presence, which uh, presents itself from being the lean-to shed, let's say, which is the fabrication shed, 
and it presents itself to uh, to the the public road and the public domain. Yvonne. Thank you, Shell. Uh, I'd like to begin my section by saying how uh, wonderful it is to sit here and hear uh, the architects of two countries uh, working together uh, across time and space uh, with their fantastic ideas and uh, a, a deep research. It is really, uh, it's, it's wonderful. And thank you for your presentations earlier on. I'd like to begin by, by kind of uh, saying the obvious, I suppose that trees are beautiful and that they add so much to our lives, their structure, their shadow, their protection, their leaves, their roots, their bark. And uh, also to share with uh, uh, our, our colleagues from other, another country that the ancient Irish script Oam was based, had based its alphabet on the names of trees. And some obviously were held as, as sacred trees and we love them and in fact, uh, I have to admit that I hug trees uh, given any opportunity. And that also that timber has an emotional component, you know, their timber is sensual, it's tactile, it affects our sense of smell, and timber is an earth gift uh, to us. And at this particular time, we are all asked individually as well as collectively to deal consciously with the earth's resources. So as architects, each building is an opportunity to deeply research possibilities. And just apropos of um, uh, other architects in time, uh, I don't have an image of it, but all of us know, I suppose, the Rietveld red and blue chair. And there's a beautiful image before it's painted red and blue and black and yellow, uh, where all the ordinary uh, elements of that chair are lined out, the ordinary uh, two by ones and smaller pieces and flat pieces of plywood. And then by craft and by design, it's transformed by color into a spatial, it's a chair, but it's also a piece of structure. So it's very interesting that this is timber transformed. And in my part of the presentation, as Shelley has referred to, I'm going to focus on how we in Grafton Architects are learning. We, uh, we won the competition in Arkansas, which was fantastic. And we set ourselves to build a building that's the storybook of timber, that the building itself would be a teacher. And as Shell has, has uh, described, the, one of the emphasis of, the, of the, the Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design in the University of Arkansas is to deeply research timber. And the university's ambition is to make the Anthony Timberland Center, which this new building will be called, uh, to be a showcase uh, for students, but also that it will be for the state of Arkansas as it develops the state's timber industry. In fact, the university has placed a, a directive on the project that only timber readily available in Arkansas can be used for the project. And this affects the options for, for us as, uh, as architects and with the structural engineers, you know, for the structural frame. So we'll be using southern yellow pine and white oak, of which, uh, which are abundant in Arkansas. In fact, the state of Arkansas grows 8 million more tons of pine annually that it actually harvests. So the state hopes that the use of yellow, uh, southern yellow pine in the CLT and the glue lambs in the manufacturing uh, facilities in Arkansas will benefit their economy and allow the harvest of the state's excess pine to be processed for construction. So this, this first image describes a time when virgin forests were what I'd call in American maybe uh, easy pickings. And we had imagined that we could, uh, all the members of Grafton Architects could wander through the forests of Arkansas and hand pick trees that we could use and make a totally new building from huge timbers. But it's interesting that when you build in the United States now, it's necessary to have a license in each state. And luckily we're working with local architects, Modus Studio based in uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas. And as we developed the design, it became apparent from local knowledge that much of the local forest had gone and that the biggest sizes of solid timber that could be got were about nine inches or 10 inches in thickness. So what I'm going to focus now on the next few, uh, few slides 
will be about education, mentioning the state and industry, local knowledge, but also the relationship between structural engineers and architecture, especially uh, when making uh, uh, timber buildings. And we've been very lucky to work with Whitby Wood because their expertise and uh, knowledge of timber is fantastic. And they are really uh, wonderful uh, uh, structural engineers to work with. So I'll begin by this sketch, which is made during the competition, which as Shelley was describing, the kind of stacked uh, educational rooms towards the busy road on the left-hand side of this image. And then also environmentally, that the big room, the fabrication shop is obviously ground-based because things have to be delivered and that's the biggest, the biggest room. But also then that uh, the, the, the roof becomes a type of blanket to protect the, uh, the spaces from the uh, heavy rains in Arkansas, this part of Arkansas, it's up in the north uh, west of Arkansas, up in the Ozarks. So it's up in the kind of hilly country. The other part of Arkansas is down on the Mississippi River, but this is up high. It has a, a really strong four seasons. And for us uh, in, in our, uh, our practice, the relationship between place, climate and space are really something that we mine and look at deeply in terms of architectural expression. So the, the catching of the very heavy rainfall became part of our uh, architectural concern, the shading from the sun, the, this natural ventilation. So we'd have the big room and uh, as Shelley has described that the, the raised auditorium laboratories and classrooms form this kind of cascading section. Uh, so educationally it's about connection and in the other way, it's also environmentally about forming a type of chimney to release uh, built up heat. And in terms of the development of the, of, of the building, this, uh, th this section is describing how we move into the design. So it, it was taller. And in terms of uh, what, we, what we have is the fabrication uh, 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 shop floor. We have the auditorium and uh, two levels of um, uh, studios. And then this uh, large space, which uh, connects down visually. So students, when they're uh, learning, not only are they making on the floor below, but they're also being able to connect with it as they're above. And Shell uh, uh, referred to, um, so James Kennedy, this beautiful model made by him in our office. You see these, the, the study as we develop it. So here is the road. You see these people on the, on the road and the general public being able to participate in, in, the, in the space. And it's something, the eight meter high glass window that we made in Bocconi University in Milan is also about connecting to city. So here we have in Fayetteville that we have people passing by, being able to see uh, students at work. And up above, you see the, where the auditorium is. And you get these, uh, as I said, working with Whitby Wood, uh, their, their engineers are uh, fantastically uh, attuned to what architecture is trying to achieve because in a timber building like this the architecture and structure are actually uh, one so you have the, the this this guy here this huge tree uh, it's very interesting it, it's uh, it's 44 inches it's 44 inches wide so you could nearly hug it like a tree but your arms my arms can't get around this guy this is 77 feet high as it goes up you'll see it you'll see it in a minute another section so here your this view is on the upper uh, deck your the this guy is in the auditorium he's looking down at the uh, uh, factory floor the fabrication floor he's able to see up through what i described in the uh, environmental chimney so you see that the actually this is a good image to describe the concrete uh, base on which these uh, big this guy is the 77 foot uh, column you'll see it uh, in a minute so this is um, uh, if you like the the tallest um, member uh, in in this and here you have on the upper level so this is the uh, lower uh, studio so students are preparing uh, drawings and models being aware of the workshop down below being aware this this window actually faces south over uh, Arkansas so it's also connecting people not only educationally but also to the place that they live in and the image on the the right hand side here is the top floor where you're facing north it's the studio the the top studio and you can see over to the uh, to the main campus of the university because where we're building is in fact a, a type of satellite to the Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design. And on the right hand side, I'm beginning with the, the Whitby Wood, uh, 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 clear drawings, uh, clear explanation, a real understanding of the architectural. It, this, 
this this building hopefully will be like a, a large piece of furniture. So you see uh, architects and engineers working together to make this kind of twinning. So you see this uh, inclined member being held by these twin uh, pieces that are coming out from the front of the building uh, to the south. And these uh, clear drawings by Whitby Wood as well describe what we were trying to do, the, the main gutter beams, uh, which are catching the, the, the heavy rain, the, the raised room, as Shelley described, the auditorium, uh, having to be clear underneath because underneath here is the fabrication shop, so it needs to be clear. So the engineers have to uh, work with us to find a way of, yes, that can hit the ground. It can have a kind of a knee joint to prop out here, but this is the, the queen post truss. So it hangs and holds this uh, uh, auditorium room. And in the drawing above, you see these, uh, these, these are about every 40 feet uh, along here. And these diagonals are the, you know, these are obviously part of the structural member to, to hold these apart. And then we also need a gantry. So there's a gantry that brings in the heavy loads of timber into here, and that needed to have a, a resting place in timber. And the clarity of, of these, uh, um, these, these, uh, these drawings, I think are, are really fantastic. That on the left-hand side, you have the base of the, of the big, uh, if you like, the main structural elements uh, held on concrete, bringing up the three, it, it's very interesting. There's something I'll talk about in, in a while. There, there's, a, a, if you like, a limit on the sizes. Uh, the, the, the biggest um, glue lamp beams, let's say, are 54 inches. There's also a highway, uh, as, as what's interesting working with, with local architects also, is that in the, the local highway code, there are restrictions on the elements that actually can be transported to the site in Fayetteville. And the maximum length of that is 60 feet. So this also, uh, this has to weave into the, um, if you like, the design. So these drawings are uh, showing the clarity. It's fat on the lower one is three, and then it goes to one as it reaches the top. You can see it here. So this magnificent uh, totem of, of uh, structure, you have it uh, uh, in terms of, of size. What I find amazing there is that we have a, this is 15 inches uh, in here. It's 15 it's 12, it's 15, and then this 10 inch one is to take the gantry that you can see it here in, in the section. So this is the gantry to take the, uh, the moving part of the, um, of the delivery. And this beautiful structure, one of the things we really wanted to do was that as a student of architecture, that you could feel, literally feel these, uh, these members. And that the axonometric on the right-hand side is really describing the, the, uh, the, uh, the type of timber, the, their fittings, and also going back to the, uh, uh, what we had hoped, you know, to go around forests and pick these huge, huge trees. In fact, this oak is, is, uh, is really made up of the, uh, the biggest members that we can find. Uh, other ones are more, if you like, composite because they have to do uh, larger uh, structural um, uh, strategies, really. And this drawing is really describing the range of timbers that, that we are working with. So the orange, which are the, if you like, the, the two staircases, this building is essentially on the eastern side, there's a, a external staircase and on the western side, the internal, the main uh, moving uh, up and down stairs with its uh, uh, elevator. So that's the orange is Southern Yellow Pine uh, CLT. And the green, which are these, uh, the, the beams, is also southern yellow pine, but they're glue lamb, so they're here. And then the the also the as Shelley was describing the the gutters, these canoes. These are about a uh, hundred feet long. These guys uh, are are also uh, glue lamb. And the purple, which is that diagonal member I showed you there, is the white oak, which is a built up. Uh, member acting uh, forces in, in terms of diagonal. And then the exterior of the building, which is, uh, uh, um, if you like, wrapped on the outside. In this drawing, it's a uh, bold uh, cypress, and we'll show you other ones uh, in a minute. So here are, uh, this is the view in the fabrication shop. You're looking up at that big uh, canoe that's taking the um, uh, taking the water, but because it's 100 feet long and 60 is the maximum you could take on the roadways, these are divided through discussions with the engineers uh, and they're, they're, they're cut and then they're uh, 
put together at very sensitive uh, and good locations. So these very clear drawings uh, show in engineering terms, the like, uh, gutter beam one and gutter beam two, how they're joined with the roof and how they uh, are joined, uh, uh, um, fabricated then on site uh, together. Jill uh, referred to uh, Peter's uh, um, uh, uh, James Kennedy, just in terms of this beautiful uh, model that uh, James made with us, which is the, these uh, glue lamb. You can see the gutters forming part of the architecture. You can see the uh, external stairs, the internal stairs is hidden here. And then this layer on the, on the outside, how we make a building that, uh, that is as timbery as possible. And as we developed as a, a, as a team um, and working with the, the fire codes, we discovered that up, uh, you can have timber um, up to 40 feet and after 40 feet, it has to be uh, treated uh, timber uh, fire for fire and above 60 feet, it has to be non-combustible. So this was something that we were learning in terms of making a, a, a building uh, in Arkansas. These are, we think this is really, uh, really an interesting kind of catalog of timbers because as we said in the beginning, really passionate from the university uh, was that uh, na uh, timbers native to Arkansas would be uh, used in this building. So this building would become like a library in the same way here as the beautiful museum by uh, uh, Dean and Woodward in Trinity College is like a library for the beautiful stones of Ireland that, that you could come and see the range of, of uh, Arkansas timbers in this building. And what we're finding in our research is that there are some timbers that we can use in the structure, some timbers that we can use in the, uh, in the exterior. And there will be ones which, because of other codes and uh, inability to use them in a kind of a general way, that we'll be able to use them for places that we touch, for handrails maybe, or door handles, so that the tactile uh, aspects of timber could be uh, exemplified in another kind of scale. But this is really very interesting for us because it shows not only the color, uh, the grain, um, but also their, their ability. So this is the uh, black locust here as a rain screen down in the, the corner and then uh, Eastern red, uh, red cedar. And the other issue, which uh, in, in countries that have a, 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 a longer tradition, if you like, or a more extensive tradition of timber building than, than we have here in Ireland, is that also that timber changes over time. And that the, the uh, for, for us, what is interesting is that the upper part of this image is, you know, what they are when they come uh, to, to site. And then over time, this is what happens, they, that they become, uh, if you like, modified, not only by time, but also by orientation and the weather, which is really interesting. Because in Arkansas, it can be really cold and it can be really hot and humid. There's a lot of a, a huge range uh, that timber has to uh, react to. And these are studies that we did for the, the 40 foot high, for the 60 foot high, and that the upper uh, level, the roof, the kind of blanket of the roof will be a, will be, um, a type of, of metal, uh, maybe not the, the, the current zone which you have here, uh, that, that it would be more silvery with the color of uh, changing, changing timber. And these last uh, few images are really describing the, uh, if you like, the ambition of the project to have, as Shelley was describing, to have a presence to celebrate itself on uh, uh, um, Martin Luther King Boulevard, which is a kind of a, a busy highway entering into the town of the city of uh, Fayetteville, but it's also sloping. So the issue of entry, of sloping down and connecting to the other part of the building, being able to see in, being having a place of exhibition, having the auditorium, being aware of both the, the huge opportunities these students have to study, but also that the, that the citizens of uh, Fayetteville would also see and come to lectures, and that the studios then would be uh, looking uh, north over the uh, over the landscape of, of Fayetteville. And the final image, uh, another of uh, James James's um, uh, Kennedy's lovely models, describes the if you like the uh, uh, upper studio and a terrace to the west. This is where the elevator is. 
and the cascading, uh, the, the, the entrance staircase, the cascading roof connecting down to the uh, outside working yard, which is here, a student entrance to connect with the uh, rest of, um, uh, of this uh, part of the campus. But for us, um, just in terms of conclusion of our, our section, that, that we are learning a lot. Uh, we are working with, uh, the, as we say, local architects. Um, we are trying to make a building uh, with uh, Whitby Wood, our um, structural engineers, that where the, the uh, essential uh, structure is celebrated within the building, where on the outside that it picks up something of the, uh, Shell had this lovely images of these kind of no nonsense kind of coal buildings, that the Ozark, this kind of the, the, uh, the sheds of the Ozark, the old no nonsense kind of tradition, but also the kind of grandeur and celebration uh, of a university building and a timber, a timber, um, if you like, container uh, for students' life. So I think that that is our last image. And I just like to, to, to finish by saying what I found uh, listening to both Natalie and Raul Yare, that the relationship between two countries and the, the, the it seems that in Estonian, hello is like Tara or Tara. And it reminds me of what uh, Raul said about visiting um, um, the kind of royal seat up there in, uh, in, in, uh, in near Navan, but also that it's like terra, like terra firma, and that timber is a growing, beautiful material. And that as we learn more, uh, that maybe the industry is a bit more versatile and allows us as architects to, uh, to make buildings uh, in an easier and more beautiful way. So thank you. Um, thank you so much, Shelley and Yvonne. I'm not sure whether you're aware of this, but there's this incredible reciprocal space going on where you're talking to one of your most beautiful spaces, in my mind, here to the theatre in the solstice. And having you on Zoom talking to your space has made a, a very, very interesting space. You could hear a pin drop in that lecture. It was really powerful. and. Uh, we kind of want to hug ye as much as your trees and your columns. And um, I'm hoping we'll be able to do that soon as well. But what, what, what glorious work. Um, and it's been really invigorating. The, the development of your Timberland Center um, is extraordinary to watch. And James, you've been working very hard. Where is he? My goodness. That's, um... We haven't changed the seat. <laughs> <laughs> Extraordinary, and uh, you're very generous to allow that to be part of your discussion as well in naming people. You've always been very generous to create a community of architecture in Ireland. Um, so I, I hope you might stay on afterwards yeah. for the discussion, please, because I'd like to involve you in the questions and answers. But uh, congratulations, uh, wonderful work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Joseph, you have a hard act to follow. Where is Joseph? He is here. Um, without further ado, I'll allow Joseph Mackey to come to the floor and talk about his uh, contribution. So um, our exhibition um, explores the idea that Ireland has a lost tradition of um, timber construction, um, which could be found or rediscovered in the 58th century timber chapels um, that we once had. Um, we know from uh, historical documentation, from painting literature, that these are incredibly important um, cultural artifacts and that they were made out of the finest materials and involving some of the, the best craftsmen. We know that they were referred to as a uh, dirt chucked, which means um, oak house. And um, this is um, a famous image from the Book of Kells that depicts one of these um, 15th century timber uh, oratories. You can see um, on the base of the image, there's a clear delineation of a silbeam, then there's a, which is kind of highlighted and kind of ornamented. 
and then there's a clear uh, marker that introduces the eaves uh, or the wall plate. And then the roof structure then is clearly detailed uh, with overhangs and finials, finials at the top. And though, although, um, although these 58th century timber chapels no longer exist, um, we can see the remnants of them in the later stone churches that follow. So this is a beautiful uh, St. Mactaris Chapel in uh, County Galway that is a 10th century uh, stone replica of an earlier 6th century timber chapel. And we can see in the, if we analyze uh, and look in detail on the stone chapel, we can see that the ante, which are the projecting uh, wings on the gable in both the wall and the roof form, are skewmorphs or uh, representations of earlier timber uh, chapels, the projection being uh, an acknowledgement of the timber corner post that would have held and supported the overhanging roof that would have protected the gable. We can see in the um, stone work that uh, is coursed over the roof that their skew morphs are a representation of the earlier timber shingles that would address the structure also. And even the position of the window, we think, well, we think to the, our research and the study of this project that that is, again is symbolic of the position of the eaves beam in relation. And then also on the roof, you can see the finials cross where the timbers of the outer uh, rafters would have crossed to connect. And then again, another image of a stone chapel in County Kerry, where again, we're looking at the uh, gable uh, detail. And you can see the projecting stone. I don't have a pointer, but you can see the, the projecting stone. That's um, where the craftsmen have gone so, uh, to great detail to indicate and replicate symbolically the wall plate that would have projected out of the internal wall to support the overhanging uh, ease beam. So um, although there's no um, physical evidence of these, of these chapels, there has been extensive archaeological investigations throughout Europe. Um, but our chapels still exist in uh, literature and poetry. And this is an 8th century uh, poem um, that describes a visit to uh, one of these um, timber chapels or, or, or oratories. It's called the Oratorio. Um, I, I won't read the poem in full, but there's a really beautiful line at the start where they talk about how the timber chapel is fashioned out of candle-shaped beams, um, which we thought was really quite provocative. And then it suggests that it was joined with, um, or that it had a, uh, a square foundation, which is, which is indicative of uh, timber chapels, but also of still beam construction. And then it talks about a, a beautiful uh, vaulted roof above uh, and a massive enclosure. So we thought, we thought those poems were really beautiful. We thought that maybe there was an opportunity to use the exhibition as a way to uh, remember the timber chapels. So we thought we might use the oratorio poem as our kind of guide uh, and as a first person account to try and recreate a, a fragment, potentially, of one of the chapels. So immediately after reading the poem, I just started doing quick sketches in my notebook about what a, what a candle shaped beam might be if it, if, it, if it was a wall enclosure. And so the top of the sketch, I'm uh, quickly doodling uh, a little elevation um, of what MacDara might be like if it was wrapped in candle shaped beams. And then I'm uh, at the bottom left, I'm thinking about, well, what position might that vertical um, timber beam taken in, in, a, in a wall uh, in relation to a wall plate and to a sill beam, how far would it project, and how much of the top would be scalloped in terms of weathering or waterproofing, or even I kept asking the question why candle shaped, so I'm kind of making these sketches to try and capture the kind of maybe the, the, that kind of initial kind of enthusiasm for a project, but also all that kind of naivety that, that is at the start where you're, you're trying to figure out something. And then from there, then we tried, thought we might expand our research. Um, a little bit to try and find gaps in our knowledge or, or try and get a greater understanding for these 15th century timber chapels. As so we go across this really beautiful book by Churches of Medieval Ireland by Tomaso Corricon, um, which goes into extensive archaeological investigations in Ireland and across Europe. And then we came across this, um, uh, the building in the middle then is a beautiful timber building in, uh, in the UK, which has these vertical staves or posts um, on a sill beam, and experts have suggested that that's a, uh, a potential um, architectural response to the candle-shaped beams, that, that, that that's, this is how it would have been done. And then we're, our, our Estonian colleagues then were Paco and Kaja, and uh, we, we exchanged wonderful kind of stories with them about, we would tell them stories about um, the ecclesiastical stories we were, we were reading about, 
uh, St. Makuta and his troubles in establishing a church. And then they told us beautiful stories about the Estonian uh, log houses um, and how there's such a wonderful tradition that they've managed to hold on to and protect and pass on from culture to culture. And in a way, it was a kind of the piece that we've missed in our culture, that we've, we've lost our chapels, that they exist in memory. Potentially in literature, we don't have physical versions of them. So we started to look at the Estonian log houses. And the image in the top right is, uh, um, is from the um, Estonian center um, for these, these of traditional building techniques. And the way that they, the way that, and it's a picture of a sill beam uh, connected to a post. And it was a detail that we were trying to figure out or speculating on in the office for a while. And then we suddenly realized that actually how the Estonian log houses were made in terms of the sill beam and the connection to a vertical post is actually very similar to, to archaeological investigations and speculation throughout all of Europe. So we kind of thought that actually there was a, the way that people might join two pieces of timber actually doesn't change significantly across culture, that the form changes and the culture potentially changes, but actually the act of making it somehow is often very pragmatic. And then we used that knowledge and we, we started to kind of draw, to draw out. And then we were thinking of our project as a, as a as remembering the chapel, but also as maybe an act of kind of memorial. So I was thinking about the etymology of the word memory comes from the, a Greek word to draw out of oneself. So here we're kind of drawing out of ourself the, a version of a, of a 5th to 8th century timber chapel. In the bottom right hand side then you see we've, in, we've inscribed it with a medieval tracing floor, which would kind of consecrate our, our imaginary chapel. And then also act as a kind of a center point to position the altar, which often sat in the center. And then through archaeological investigations and studies, we were able to work out the height of the eaves. Uh, the angle of the roof was normally 60 degrees in these buildings, which meant they often didn't require a, a wall type because the, the angle was, was so sharp at 60, it meant that most of the loads just transferred directly to the walls. And then that angle of 60 became quite symbolic in terms of the buildings being recognized as churches. And then here then we're kind of working up um, what we think maybe 1 to 10 and 1 to 20 details of candle-shaped beams might look like. That was the kind of, well, we're, at this moment, I suppose we're trying to the, understand all of the church. We haven't, but we, I did think there was something maybe really quite beautiful, potentially in that candle-shaped beam. So we're trying to work out how it might fit into a wall plate and would that be a double plate? And then we're trying to work out how it might sit or not be notched into a sill. And um, then we saw in the Estonian log houses that they're often raised up in stones and then archaeological investigations in Switzerland and France have often revealed that some of these timber sill beam structures were often sat on stones as well, so we're starting to kind of draw that in our little 1 to 20 sections on our drawings. And then we had an idea that uh, because the project was maybe about memory and remembering the chapel, we were kind of remembering that uh, French philosopher uh, Maurice Holbeck, the idea of, uh, of that architecture can embody inscribed and incorporated memory and that the act of actually making the project and the people coming together from the community to make it would actually be as maybe significant as the building itself. So here we're trying to make a little drawing where we've got people and monks gathering together to make the structure, and then we're stitching the Latin and the English translation of the poem back in together to make this kind of drawing. And again, we're trying to, we're still thinking about this candle-shaped beam, which is in the bottom right, and how, how a row of those might sit on a wall. Um, and in a way that I thought that the exhibition piece might just, might just explore uh, the relationship of, that, of those candle-shaped beams. So here we are making, I'm making a little model, one, one of the right, a little quick balsa model, very crude, but this idea of, uh, of how a series of, of those candle-shaped beams might sit in the wall, and we thought it might be fun to play with, uh, to make a window section as well, so potentially we speculate that one of those posts might just shorten, and then the scallop of the candle shape becomes almost like a sill, and then the left-hand side then we're testing how many columns are, is enough and how many is not enough. So we're kind of judging it. And then we wanted the exhibition piece. This is our design of the exhibition piece. So the piece on the right shows a, the top piece is, a, is the eaves or the wall plate. And then the bottom section is the sill. And this series of kind of marching columns is sit in, in between with our kind of candle-shaped top. Um, and we wanted the model to have a kind of, or the exhibition piece to have almost like an unfinished quality, um, that it was almost sitting in the exhibition trying to actively remember the rest of the church. And then here as a way to maybe to jump back out again from the facade study, we thought we might, to better understand the original transmutation from the 6th century timber chapel to the 10th century stone version, 
we're projecting back our, our, a model that we made that's overlaid on the original McDara Chapel as a way to maybe speculate or to deliberately disrupt the kind of phylum or the history of timber oratories by speculating about what it may have actually looked like. And so it's a very quick image, but we discovered through our research that, uh, and some of the archaeological investigations, that the corner posts of these chapels were often uh, richly ornamented. So uh, on our image, we're kind of ornamenting the corner posts. And we know that the projection in the overhang of the gable was seen as, uh, as, as religious and symbolic. So again, we're, we're, we're ornamenting that. So then we thought actually maybe all of the important junctions and interface between the inside and the outside are dressed with ornaments. So we've ornamented the, the sill and the, and the side. And then the chapel then is, is reinstated in Magdara in our imagination or our memory as a, a sill beam construction with a series of these vertical uh, candle-shaped beams that, that make the wall. I mean, there's no, there's no, we know that Magdara, uh, the original Magdara chapel was a timber one, and we know that uh, sill beam construction was quite extensive in Ireland and that uh, vertical post structures like this were used in mill buildings and in churches. We don't know for certain what the Magdara one is like, but we're kind of enjoying the, the speculation that it might have been something like this. And then after we had our, our piece designed by our exhibition, we were very lucky that a uh, really good maker who uh, lives not far from us, called Alan, Alan Meredith, who works primarily in Irish oak, and he agreed, after some persuasion, to, to take on our, our piece. And this is us in a, in a kind of a fresh morning in, uh, in the Midlands inspecting uh, branch oak that had come down in the storm before Christmas and that Alan managed to kind of procure for us. And so we're kind of picking out what might be the best pieces and the most so suitable pieces for it for our, our exhibit. And then this is after Alan has done some work to kind of strip them back and to start and to split the logs in the way we, we would have thought they were split with like a full, a full log or a full branch that's split to make two pieces of a wall. And the image on the left then is where we're exploring. And there's like pencil marks where we're testing out how much is enough of a scallop. Um, and, then, uh, and then on the image on the right then we've got a kind of line up of columns. We're trying to pick which one will make the final model we were kind of trying to, wanted to pick uh, posts that had a kind of natural curve and curvature, so we didn't have to overwork the timber too much. We didn't want it to be straight. We wanted to let the, the kind of natural kind of marks or growth patterns of the timber exist, and so we picked them. And I really like this model because um, I really like the two, the two columns sitting at the end. It's like they're kind of having a conversation with the other columns or something, who've all had their kind of bark stripped. And for me, the columns kind of took on this kind of almost kind of anthropomorphic quality through the study. And, and at the end of it, now I, I see them more like kind of, you know, a, a, like an Irish example of uh, caryatid or something that would have stacked in the wall but actually represented figures or people in the church. And we know from, from our research that there's fifth to eighth century kind of carved stone crosses that depict people in the facades. And up, up until now, people have thought, well, actually, that's, it's symbolic. But I, I think it's actually maybe that's its a representation of the, of the vertical posts themselves. And then here's our piece in the exhibition. It's a one-to-one -one kind of candle-shaped uh, post and beam and eaves detail of four columns with a, with a window. And uh, as I said, it's deliberately kind of slipped. And it's just a kind of unfinished piece. It's all, it's all made in Irish oak. And it's all uh, green oak, but it's been dried a little bit. So the exhibition model itself is cracking and moving over time. So it's constantly kind of changing. Um, and then I suppose, um, again, I mean, another kind of maybe interesting, uh, well, for us, interesting kind of discovery through it is that, you know, I, I think that the scallop at the top is maybe a skew morph that represents the kind of the axe cutting of the original timbers. Um, that was a kind of practical output that then became something kind of symbolic at a later date. Um, yeah, so that, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Um, I'd never heard of a candlestick column before. I'm, I'm kind of intrigued and the relationship between the sill plate and the wall plate and how that stands. We might further that in the questions and answers, but what a, a very thoughtful, deep piece. Um, thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, we might move on to the next pairing, which is Robert Burke Architects with Creatimus Solutions. Thanks very much, Peter. And uh, it's just so wonderful to finally be here today. Um, 
with all of our colleagues and meeting them face to face and uh, to be in such a wonderful <coughs> space designed by Shelley and Yvonne. Um, so I'm Robert Burke, uh, director of Robert Burke Architects. Um, we're a small practice based in the center of Dublin, um, led by myself, um, my fantastic associate, Anna Pierce, who's been with the practice for is it nine or 10 years, more years than we care to remember. And uh, in this photo, we had uh, James Forbes, uh, who left us recently after three years, and we're more recently joined by Kevin Sweeney, who started a few weeks ago, and has been done amazing work uh, this week on helping to assemble the uh, ex exhibition piece. So a, a little bit, I'm going to talk first, and then Rene from Creative Solutions is going to um, speak about his uh, part in the process. Um, we're, as I said, a small practice. We, our, our work, we, we develop our designs through an open, collaborative, and um, uh, I have a one-liner for this, which everybody's supposed to know. Um, exploratory design process resulting in unique spaces of character, integrity, and material richness. And uh, everything we do, we try and underpin with a sense of um, social consciousness and an environmental responsibility. And this is just a sample of projects that we've done, uh, residential, uh, working with school communities, and participatory projects. The last one there was a project we did. Our, our second uh, project with the Irish Architecture Foundation, uh, which is about collaborating in uh, local communities to um, reimagine their um, urban, suburban environment. So this is a shot from, uh, can't even remember how long ago, but we would meet, uh, uh, Rene beside me is, is not in this photo, he's actually showing us the, the empty box, and uh, we, we were very, naughty students because we didn't actually do anything with uh, the box that was described earlier that we were supposed to extend over and back between here and Tallinn. But I think we were just too anxious to, to get a project started and figure out a way of working together. Uh, but you can see Karen on the top right, um, Rennie's colleague, who's uh, looking rather bemused at what I'm saying possibly. Uh, and then Anna and James. Uh, one thing that we did agree on was that um, uh, we're both interested in it. We both have a grave concern for the climate and bio biodiversity crisis that, that the, the world is in. And we observed that both Estonia and Ireland are actually very poor performers when it comes to uh, our carbon footprints. We're actually among the three worst performers in Europe after uh, Luxembourg, interestingly. And uh, we also uh, talked about the cities that we're both in, which are both uh, possibly worse in the Irish case. We have a lot of suburban sprawl because of our, our lack of, of planning, and that leads to car dependency and, and subsequent uh, um, uh, emissions. So there's a preoccupation with uh, domestic uh, housing, uh, dwelling solutions for the city. Uh, we looked at um, how houses are made in our respective cities. Um, the, the Estonians clearly have, have, have modernized, uh, whereas we still <laughs> design quite, uh, you know, we, we hark to the past a lot when it comes to commercial building. And so there's a, a level of blandness and um, high embodied carbon with the materials that are used to, to construct these buildings. So again, just thinking more about, uh, the, well, the, the, the scale of work that, that, that we work with and, and, uh, and how, we, how we work together. Um, if you do a Google search for both of our practices, you, you, you tend to come up with the images on the left for our work, which is it's mainly a domestic scale. It's, it's got a preoccupation with craft, materiality. Uh, we've intuitively always used timber uh, because we, we like it for its tactility, for its lightness, for its... Um, availability for its uh, sustainability, um, although that's a very uh, nuanced word. Um, and then creating solutions who um, develop uh, apps uh, that allow building users to customize their buildings, uh, which are made from mass timber construction, which Rene is going to elaborate on. Um, but one thing we did realize 
during our early discussions is that we both actually went to, uh, did our part two uh, master's courses in East London University at different times in the past. Uh, myself having had a, a Professor Peter Salter as a, as a tutor, which where you can probably see elements of, of the domestic scale, the human scale, the craft, and, and Rene for uh, um, a lecturer called uh, Paul Coates, who was very interested in computer-generated design. So we, we both went to the same university, but took very different, different paths and, and have, have quite different interests. So, which you might summarize in the case of Creatimus as maybe uh, empowering people to customize space using digital tools. And uh, in our own case, that maybe to restore the se a sense of craft and participation into the act of building. And so uh, using these uh, kind of principles, we, we tried to develop a piece that reflected our, both of our interests. Um, these are just quotes from the brief that, that we really like, uh, that, that everybody had to work to. And so the, which is why it's so amazing to go upstairs and see how 10 different practices have responded in such different ways to the same brief. But it was one of the lines was about creating variety in a world that's otherwise striving for common standardized values. And to see what opportunity exists to interpret and reuse standardized material extracted from existing sources following deconstruction. So big, big questions to answer. So we, uh, given our concern for um, sustainability and, and the, um, the, the idea of circularity, uh, which is a, a, a big word being used at the moment, uh, we came up with a, a system that probably raises more questions than it answers, but hopefully in a good way. Um, a, a way of building at a small scale that is, is circular and um, and, and uh, can involve uh, using new and, and reused materials. So it's based, the, the title of the project is Butterfly Building and it comes from economist Kate Rayworth's uh, Don't Book Donut Economics that I, I recommend everybody reads, uh, where she describes our, our current linear process of uh, production um, of take, make, use and dispose um, into a circular uh, system uh, of on the left you have natural systems that, that regenerate where um, things that are, are consumed are brought back into the system at the end of their life and on the right the what they call technical nutrients which are human made um, things that, that can want, instead of being disposed of can go back into the uh, to create into the system to create new uh, products and so we came up with this step-by-step uh, -step process whereby um, th this system could, be, could possibly work. And now there are, every stage of this process needs further development and, and working out, but it, it points towards um, a system that, that we think has, has potential. Uh, starting with the, the question as to whether we actually need to build. I mean, I think that's, that's worth asking uh, these days something I, I find myself amazingly almost putting myself out of a job by asking that question to, climb a, to, to clients, do you actually need an extension on your house? And uh, if the answer is yes, you say, are you sure? And if they say, well, no, then you say, can I re reconfigure existing spaces to meet my requirements? If they say yes, well then, well done, you've made the most environmentally friendly decision. If they say no, we'll then proceed to step two. Uh, where you sit down with your architect. And uh, I, I, I don't think, although Rene is interested in computerized, digitized processes, I'm not, I don't think the architect has been eliminated from that process. Um, it's something we would hope will continue for until, until the bots take over. <laughs> um, but the architect is very central to this process still. And um, the, the, help, the, the architect would help the client to design a, a space that is as compact as, as possible, uh, using as few components as possible, and then that there might be some kind of a system whereby the elements of this uh, construction can be uh, broken down into a schedule of, of pieces that uh, the, an, an app can then direct you to a municipal bring center where you can go and um, choose these items from, from reused sources, like so the windows, say, in, in OGU's project, 
could maybe be used in a, in a structure like this. And the, then you, you go and you choose your materials. Uh, so from, say, the Bring Center, um, obviously this raises questions around um, certification and building regulations, and maybe there's a, an argument for deregulation of certain uh, things to, to allow us to reuse existing components. Uh, I mean, another interesting thing that came up is the question as to whether does d the design for disassembly actually work when you're tweaking existing buildings, or does it only work with new buildings? I think Rene has things to say about that. Uh, but central to uh, the, the design is that we would actually use new uh, timber, locally sourced Irish timber for the main structure of the building, but that it can be clipped together using brackets rather than screws and bolts uh, so that it can be disassembled um, for reuse in future buildings. And then the top right image is that there are a very limited number of new materials such as wiring and sockets uh, that you'd have to get new. And then step five is where the small structure, whether it's an extension or a small house, can be assembled uh, maybe by the, the owners of the building if, if, the, if the technique is, is simple enough. It could be used from lengths of timber or if our Ireland were to develop its own CLT or DLT um, timber system, then maybe it could be done that way. It doesn't really matter. Um, but then, because of the way it's put together, um, it can be unclipped and, and uh, disassembled quite easily and returned back to the Bring Center. So, this is a rather uh, dreamy image of how this principle could be applied across the landscape whereby people can uh, start building these structures in their own backyards using uh, trees sourced from their backyard and uh, perhaps the, uh, the, 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 even the fabric of the roof could be made from uh, other sources, such as uh, the tarpaulin of a truck, uh, as in the case of our um, exhibition piece, so, uh, which you can see upstairs. So really, it, this just brings together, um, it, it, it embodies a lot of the ideas that I've just described in a slightly abstracted way, but was... Um, we have to we have to thank um, uh, Des O'Toole, the marketing and communications manager of Quilcha, who uh, who sponsored the timber and also which was sourced from Cool Rain sawmills in County Leash, and also to thank um, Shane Duffley, uh, the our uh, joiner that we work with on nearly every project, and his um, his partner um, colleague uh, Garvin. Um, and so I'm going to hand you over to Rene. When you go upstairs, you can sit down on a bench and uh, use the app that Rene and his team designed to configure uh, your own butterfly building and uh, calculate the embodied energy of each material choice. So I'll hand you over to Rene. Lovely. Thank you, Robert. So um, I represent Creatum Solutions. Uh, we are architects, designers, uh, we are software developers. Um, unlike other architects, uh, we don't design houses, we design systems for architects, for developers, uh, for manufacturers, uh, for home buyers to design sustainable buildings. And I think Robert brought up this idea, can technology take over from architects? I don't think it can. I think architecture is such an ill-defined problem. We can't actually define what it is to make an architecture. So rest assured, so architect, architects are never going to be banished. Um, so, but we've seen with, with Robert Works and many other architects presenting here as well, is uh, actually about circularity and then and, and, and so wood in the, in the center of circularity. We see it, it's hard work to actually retrofit. Uh, to, to actually, circularity is not really tuned for retrofitting, but it can be really done for new build. And that's what we're really looking for. Um, so if we actually radically change the way we construct buildings, use more of a manufacturing and off-site construction, we can use more renewable energy. We need to use more uh, biogenic materials or grown materials and timber including, but also hemp and straws and other materials. 
then we then we actually uh, create less burden for our natural environment, but our built environment really needs to be the main source of the materials. And uh, but we can really use it only when the uh, we don't just ret retrieve materials, but we reuse the building components and recreate our built environment from those components. Um, it kind of begs uh, new systems to be, uh, and new standards to be uh, established, uh, modular uh, standards that you can use to build different kind of buildings. And you can take them apart as components and reuse in other buildings. Um, so uh, I think it, it doesn't, it's really applicable for new build, I guess. For, for retrofitting, it's, it's not so easy. And these types of new systems, modular systems and manufacturable systems, uh, we can use them to, to create the, uh, distributed manufacturing systems. So if we establish standards, we can, we can commission those standard components from different parts of, uh, uh, of the world even. Uh, and uh, I think one of the uh, uh, one of the really the key uh, key issue there is can we actually create a system that's customizable that's uh, that can be customized to user needs so it can be personalized or uh, really localized to the local needs and and we believe it's possible so we, uh, it's, it's uh, this no, uh, notion of uh, mass customization and and it can be used a limited set of uh, components or a kit of parts uh, to to really create a, a huge variety of buildings of different uh, look and feel um, so so really the kit of parts is the central piece that, that the concept is geared around and, and that it gives us the opportunity really to connect the designer with the manufacturing of buildings or really a home buyer even in some cases with, with, with uh, smaller buildings to the manufacturing and, and what, what that does it give us? It, it gives us uh, uh, it gives us really a, a kind of a different kind of um, ability to design buildings. So we, we already know the cost of construction, for example, during the, fa uh, during the design. Uh, it, it's real-time carbon calculations can be embedded in such software. So we really don't have to do this typical way of, of designing and then uh, procurement, uh, construction procurement, and then realize, uh, uh, find out that we built a really unsustainable building, but we can really real -time, uh, have real-time calculations during the process. So future buildings, we believe, really can be resourced from three main uh, sources. You can either get it manufactured from uh, mo hopefully mostly by genic uh, content, you can actually get it from the stores because they can be pre-created or you can get it from the uh, built environment itself. So buildings to be uh, disassembled, uh, you can use that for as a, as a really the resource to build new ones. Uh, it also allows us to kind of do the calculations like I said before and then we, we, we decided to call this a carbon configurator. You can really observe the, the carbon footprint of, uh, of your materials during the design already. Uh, you cannot possibly observe the carbon footprint, but also the, the, the carbon handprint, for example, um, when you use uh, biodegradable insulation, hemp or straws. So it, it really affects, uh, affects the handprint of the building more than the footprint. So for the woodworks, really, what, what, it, what it gave us, it gave us opportunity to really develop the first prototype for this software. So and this is a sketch that I sent to Robert and his team, uh, I think, a year ago. And we, we asked you to really, can you design us a, this, uh, a first kit of part or uh, components for the butterfly building? And, and, and luckily, Robert and, and his team agreed. And, and then and, and we pretty much proceeded from there. So that's the exhibition piece that you can see within the butterfly building upstairs. You can play around with that. There are QR codes. You can, you can just uh, record it and then play it around in your, in your own mobile device or in your computer. And um, well, that, that's really, I mean, a good, good 
uh, think about the uh, Woodworks program that it really kicked it off. We wouldn't have done it uh, uh, without it. And we hope that in the next round, uh, when the exhibition travels to Estonia, we, 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 uh, we create the next, uh, next version of it and, and make it a lot more flexible. Um, but I think there are a couple of interesting aspects what we talked with Robert as well about it, that we, when you choose your components and you see how much carbon it contains, uh, it's not uh, straightforward anymore. We can't really say that there are good and bad materials. So there are materials that have more um, embodied carbon, so you can store it in the building and your buildings can become carbon sink. Uh, but for example, if you choose the CLT walls over the blockwork walls, your, the trees you need to cut down actually increases for obvious reasons. You put them, but you store them more in the building, you burn them less in the process of making the materials. But I think it, we can only just say what's right and what's wrong, or, or what's more right and what's, what's, what's more wrong, only if we actually put the building in the context. So we say maybe that within, uh, in Estonia it m makes more sense to build more out of wood, because we have a, a wood as a local resource. We store it in the buildings and it stays there for 50, 60, maybe, maybe 100 years. Um, but, uh, but here in Ireland, maybe less so. Well, but to contradict myself, as we also found out actually that, that during the life cycle assessment, uh, what we did for this building, that transportation has a, such a, a small impact on the overall CO2 footprint that you can almost ignore it. So, um, so you can make, you can really make, if you make buildings in Estonian factories using solar power uh, and transport them to Ireland, it's actually very quite sustainable. And I think there are lots of things you can you can actually start. I mean, there, there are many questions, like Robert says, that the same applications also brings them up rather than gives the answers to it. Uh, but yeah, well, have a have a play around. And uh, I don't know, Robert, do you want to actually continue from? Okay, well, that's it then. Thank you. Thank you, Rennie and Robert. Um, there was an urgency to what you were talking about and a need for architects of all ages, from students right through to fully tested architects like Shelley and Yvonne, to learn about these things and to upskill. And it really does speak to an urgency and uh, a currency in what we all do in terms of making everyday choices. And that really rang through with your presentation. It was very, very thorough, and I really enjoyed the passion in which he both spoke about your work. It's really fluid and very heartening to hear. Um, I'll move on without further ado. There's uh, two more contributors. Uh, the next is PPA, and that's Peter Pear Architects. And it's Peter, Kirke, Eva, and we have an accordionist composer, Tulika, Tuliki, am I right? And Sander, the composer. And I believe there's a piece of music as part of this on stage for the next 10 to 15 minutes. Hello. We are representing uh, Peter Bera Architects. Um, my name is Eva. Uh, this is uh, Kirke. And our collaborating musicians, uh, Tuliki and Sander. Uh, I think you can put on the music. Thank you. So, um, yeah, this is us. Uh, so we are going to present to you our journey throughout this project, uh, which was not a straight line from A to B. Uh, but first, a quick introduction to a few earlier projects, uh, which uh, try to bring out the character of timber and different possibilities of using it. So this is a tree house from 2005, which is uh, built from branches and sticks, and uses a uh, braiding technique. And uh, this is a private house which uh, uses uh, facade cladding of timber in an, an untraditional way. And this is a shelter from two years back which uh, uses almost uh, unprocessed uh, wood for the facade. 
so as we are interested in uh, the timber character in our office, we started this uh, Woodworks project uh, with investigating uh, how time and weather affects uh, timber. And we collected um, and archived some uh, wood, old wood from our office backyard. And at the same time, our partner office uh, in Ireland, the workshop, uh, they were interested in growing their own forest in Ireland. So that made us think uh, about the data of uh, Estonian forest. Uh, like, is it even possible to own a forest, uh, Estonian forest by foreigners? Who owns Estonian forest and um, what are the influences? And to support their ambition of owning a forest, uh, we thought it's uh, like fun to send them a few buying opportunities in Estonia, uh, just for information and comparison. And uh, also with the box, we sent them a piece of Estonian forest and the sound and the taste of it. So we sent them small baby trees and a lemonade made of a spruce tree and um, uh, sounds recorded in Estonian forest with different weather. Yes. <clears throat> Hmm. We architects are used to analyze and perceive forest as a spatial and material quality. At the same time, what makes timber different from concrete, uh, glass, plastic and gives it a unique character uh, are the invisible qualities. Starting from the smell of the wood, the sound that you hear in a forest, reflecting its habitants, species, form, health, seasons, or the way how trees communicate with each other in a seemingly mysterious ways. Uh, maybe you have heard about this so-called wood wide web. We came to a conclusion that we create a piece of art inspired those immaterial qualities and luckily, our paths uh, crossed with our now partners, two professional musicians and composers, Tulik and Sander. Through discussions, we found that uh, we share a lot of values on the topic of forest. It was then meant to be that the sound is, out of all the mediums, uh, the one which we will use to bring out the qualities of space. Also in architecture, sounds or acoustics are a parameter how to describe a character of the space. So we created a sound spatial installation with 16 hanging speakers and touching the hearing sense. And we formed the sound landscape inspired by the Estonian forest. And now Dulik and Sander explain their method, how they approach the task and constructed the symphony of the forest. Um, thanks, Kirke and Eva, and thanks for incorporating us into this um, project. Uh, the day has been really inspirational. All the presentations have um, really touched me. <laughs> um, and since I'm a musician and I, I'm not an art architect, I, even more so, um, and really like made me think about um, timber and its um, different usabilities. Uh, anyway, yeah, so uh, me and uh, Tulik were invited by uh, Kirke, um, Eva and Peter um, to join them and, um, and uh, brainstorm how to um, make an installation that um, sort of uh, gives forward or, or carries, uh, carries the, the emotion of the forest. So what we did with, uh, with Tuleki is that we um, took uh, some field recordings we've done on, on our uh, uh, mobile phones from uh, different parts of Estonian forests. I'm from Sarma, which is an island. So um, uh, the island has lots of junipers, and I, I had sounds of junipers on my phone. Um, and and Tuleki is from Varuma, which is uh, really south of Estonia and has huge, like, um, very ancient... Uh, forest uh, areas, and uh, and she had loads of recordings from there. So what we did, we brought those recordings to the studio, 
um, and we started to uh, really listen to these and and uh, and watch the frequency spectrum of uh, of the recordings, and we realized that there's some uh, parts that sort of um, well they uh, spike out on the frequency spectrum, so we. Uh, amplified those and uh, and got ourselves some spikes uh, that represented um, some specific frequencies. So uh, <laughs> yeah, to the uh, so that we actually got a G major from from our uh, forests. Uh, so the notes. <laughs> this is a really strange thing, but but uh, it happened. So um, Estonian forests sounds a lot like G major. Uh, <laughs> um, and then, uh, since uh, Tuliki was, um, or is, an amazing uh, free bass uh, player, we thought we'd recreate our own emotions and our own, um, you know, what we've been through in the forest or what forest means for us through her instruments. So what we did is that we, um, Used that inspiration of the field uh, recordings and then um, turned it around and re recorded a lot of accordion uh, on top of it, recreating the atmospheres that we heard in the recordings. Uh, I hope that makes sense. And then, yeah, this is another instrument we used, the only, only two other ones that weren't the accordion. Everything else on the installation is from. Um, from the accordion and a little bit from the from the field recordings, and uh, yeah, um, if anybody has more questions about the the you know the the frequencies and the and the physical acoustic side of the stuff, then you can just come and ask me later. But um, Tulik is going to talk about the piece itself. Yeah, the piece is called the Forest Symphony or Wood Wide Web. And it has seven parts. First part is about the creation. And maybe you, some of you have heard, maybe not, but in the Baltofenic Runosong tunes, there is this theme quite heavily present, how to create the creation of the world. So that kind of fell naturally. The second part is about how the creatures are moving in. And uh, the whole forest ecosystem is created. And the third part is called In Full Bloom. So then the whole ecosystem is enjoying itself. And you know, um, when I go into the forest, it's like a really natural environment for me. Um, then I feel like all different layers, you know, the bus is there somewhere and then something happening here and then something here and then something there, which I can't really grab. So this is uh, the third part is about that. And the fourth part is hibernation, when all of this wonderful uh, ecosystem, it goes into hibernation and we think that the forest is quiet, but actually under the surface, under the snow, under moss, under everything, this really vibrant life is still going on. And then we come into the fifth part, which is a bit tragic, uh, when the forestry machines come and try to cut down the uh, hibernated forest. Uh, but the sixth part uh, gives a bit light to the fifth one, because usually when you cut down a tree, you make something of it, isn't it so? And that's the wonderful thing, that the uh, timber can, can live on. So the sixth part is about how trees get the rebirth as wind chimes, and they will sound on. Uh, and the seventh and the last part takes it all together, um, and it's called Forest Sanctuary. Um, so forest is really essential to Baltofinic culture, Finnogre culture. Uh, and Baltofinic culture is actually about 5,000 years old. So, uh, and the Baltofinic person, um, the soul of the Baltofinic person with an animistic sense of life is some kind of mythically fused together by culture and nature. So, um, yeah, I think that's kind of a wonderful thing that keeps your feet on ground. And as Sander said, I'm, my roots are in Viroma, so my um, grandmother, she, forest was everything for her, and she used to go there when, when she was sad, when she was happy. It was her home, 
and luckily I have that in my veins also. So she even uh, could whistle so that uh, um, rain clouds go away. I don't know if it was just something she made up, but she was really like, yes, I learned it from my mother. Um, so uh, as our philosophic writer, Valdur Mikita says, that an Estonian comes with a mushroom knife in one hand and Skype in the other hand. So have you ever seen a mushroom knife? No, it's, it's a knife with a little brush on one side, then there's a handle, and then it's not so sharp, maybe usually plastic or sometimes uh, made of steel, so you cut the mushroom and then you can brush it, and then it's ready for the meal. So you're all really welcome to come a bit earlier than to Tallinn, so that maybe we can go pick some mushrooms and Skype to Ireland and show them. Anyway, <laughs> we are really happy that, uh, that we could do this project and I usually record myself in the forest because forest is, is uh, for my accordion, not this one, this is actually deliberately green for this project, yeah? Uh, but my blue accordion, which is a bit bigger, it resonates uh, at its best in the forest, in coniferous forest. So I'm really happy that we could do this and we, as Sander said, we shared a lot of thoughts. So you are all very welcome to a live performance after this seminar is over and we will play uh, in the gallery. So, and the bus will not leave before we have finished. Thank you very much. What a delight. That was amazing. Um, I never knew the forest sounded like G major. Sander, that was beautiful. Um, and I'm not sure, Tuliki, if I picked this up, Baltophilic culture? Wow. <laughs> amazing, absolutely amazing. That was, that was very beautiful and uh, from Peter Pear Architects as well. Um, the introduction was terrific. Uh, last but not least, we have workshop. So I believe it's David McInerney who's going to introduce the work of David Williams, Seamus Borage, and David McInerney. Thanks, Peter. Um, firstly, I just want to thank everyone that asked us to get involved in this. Um, the curators, the organizers, Solstice. Um, it's been a fantastic process to be involved in, and um, we've enjoyed it um, to date, and it's really great to be back here and to meet everyone. There's a lot of faces that we all haven't seen in a while, so. Um, I will get going, and I'll try to keep it brief. I know we're the last speakers, and everyone's probably tired at this stage. Um, this is an image that um, we made for our pavilion, um, which is, looking top down or exhibit pavilion pops into my head from time to time. Um, so I have started with an image of the piece that we made um, to give a brief description of what it is. I suppose it's an experimental construction in a way. Um, it's a three tiered um, structure that has an enclosure. It has an inside and outside. Um, the experimentation was through how do we make this, what its life cycle is, how do we join these pieces together. Um, and the first place that we started was a response to the brief, and it was a written response that we gave. So um, within this, and there's a lot of text, I won't go through it, there is a response to two main things. One is we had a question of, we have a lot of information about wood, but do we have a lot of knowledge about it? And was there um, a time in which we had more knowledge looking at the title, Another Lost Tradition? The second was about a value system, and that was part one of the words given to us in the, brief, in the brief, value. And we were thinking, do we have a value system or any value when we take wood out of a forest? What, do we have an equitable relationship with it, or are we just extracting? So we went back into um, Irish culture to try and understand, was there once a value system, and what type of knowledge did they have with wood? So we looked back to Brehan law, which was Celtic law, which was unwritten, um, and it was in place up until the Norman invasion. And 
within this, there was a classification of all our trees and bushes, which roughly mirrored our society. So there was a relationship between nobles in society that were very important trees, um, down to bushes, which were less important. And if we misused or mistreated trees, there was penalties involved in it. So everyone had to have an intimate relationship with the trees around us, because if you didn't, you could lose a few liters of milk from your cow, which was very important to you at the time. Um, and trees were also ingrained in our language, in our culture, in our mythology. So for example, yew trees were a connection between life and death, between us and the other world. So you, see, you still see them in cemeteries today. You have Scots pines where druids would burn the wood of Scots pines um, around the solstice to represent the changing of seasons, or you have birch, which is about renewal. It was one of the first trees to leaf. Um, this was one of the first places where we started in our collaboration. We weren't as diligent in sending a box over. We were, as well, bad students. Um, but um, it was great to receive and have those initial conversations um, with our collaborators. So um, we started with this cycle from uh, the birth of a tree to um, it degrading back into the ground. And we were initially interested in this first half of the cycle from, um, it, from a sapling to becoming a tree to when we process the timber. So when we thought about a value system, we were thinking, well, what we do at the minute is we take a tree and then we chop it up into smaller pieces and then we use it in construction. But then when we disassemble those things, it becomes harder to reuse them. What we wanted, to, what one of our initial thoughts was, well, if we don't initially chop it up, it has the raw potential to be reused in its full capacity through its next cycle. And depending on how much you chop it down the next time, it also has more potential for reuse again. So we went to look at some precedent to see if there was places in which they didn't just chop up trees initially. Um, so where they're in their pole form. Um, and we looked at Norwegian stave churches, and this is an example of one, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but it's Ernest, and it's a 12th century stave church. So within the church, um, it's able to spring extremely tall uh, in, in its arch because the height of these poles. So the poles themselves are extremely resilient. If you see on some of the drawings, actually less evident in these drawings, but in other drawings they are, um, where they've been patched over time. Um, so if they got damaged, you were able to patch them. Um, and then another interesting thing is once you leave it in this form, you need to think, well, how does it connect to something else? Because it's not the only element of a building, or in, in this case, in Joe's case, it is a very important part of the building. Um, so we need to think about how do we connect it to another piece in order to develop maybe a system like a frame. Um, I suppose it's important to say that we're not, we didn't aim to set out a theory of how we deal with this. We were looking to get back to the knowledge and work through the process. Um, of how do, if we aren't going to chop these things up, how do we use them? So we ended up going down one route initially, which we didn't pursue in the end, but it was looking at green timber. So when you cut a tree, and initially it's green, so it contains a lot of moisture, and once it dries out, it contracts. So there's type of joints in which you can join two pieces together and through the drying out process, they will become stable and stiff. Um, we decided not to go down that route for various reasons, um, but we were trying to see, well, if you have many of these elements coming together, how would you join them? And we're looking at a type of joint which came up earlier in a different discussion about um, one piece relying on the next. So by moving the joints of each piece away from a central point, you avoid collision. Because once you have collision of lots of pieces, it's very difficult to resolve. So once they move off of each other, you can deal with each joint from one to another in a quite efficient way. So we didn't really know where we were going in terms of resolving this, so there was lots of testing. Do you need to introduce another piece, um, like a strap? Do you, um, can we do it with 
the actual solid piece and carve it out. Um, what's, what is another material if we decide to do it? And through collaboration with our manufacturers and discussion towards ourselves, um, we contacted two friends of ours that studied architecture in years above and below us. And they've gone up into different interesting routes where they're working with timber now. And one works in digital fabrication and the other works with um, solid wood. So we decided to pursue a type of joint where we would look at contemporary technology like digital fabrication to make another piece to join to something which is quite solid, which is the timber. And that would be simply doweled through. So trying to reduce the process involved in putting these things together. Um, and that's when we arrived on this three-tiered structure. So it had an interior. As you can see, it's, uh, it pinwheels around a center point. And we had to, in order to create an entrance, we had to disrupt the completion of the pinwheel. And that had to be resolved by stopping them at a, at a single point. So we needed a criteria for selecting the timber. And we wanted, from our initial discussions, to go um, and pick a native Irish tree. And from the criteria that we needed, we needed a tree trunk of between maybe 130 to 170 millimeters. Um, we wanted it fairly straight, and we wanted it to have an interesting bark. And birch is one of those types of trees that fit the criteria. Um, a long process to actually get it. Uh, I should note that we also haven't planted a forest yet, which is still on our uh, wish list. Um, and we ended up, through a long, difficult process, getting a birch that was intercepted from, it was taken out of a bog road on its way to firewood, and we intercepted it along that way before it went to firewood. Um, and from there, it was delivered to Patrick Furnell in Carlow to process it. At the same time, Mike McLaughlin from Monaroo in Limerick um, CNC'd the plywood joints and assembled them. Patrick had to set up, ignore the health and safety, uh, Patrick had to set up the, a proprietary jig because this isn't a common thing that people do, so he had to figure out a way in which to do it, and this entire process was trying to figure out a way to do it. So a proprietary jig was set up in which you can um, get two angles uh, 90 degrees from each other at either end um, in line with each other. And then they had to be assembled together. So again, a new set of jigs to try and have two fixed points where the log could sit in the center. What we kind of realized from this is that even if the log bowed, it didn't matter because we had two fixed points at either end. So the piece in the middle could be wavy or anything. They were fixed together with um, oak dowels, which is quite a robust hardwood. Um, and then to make the enclosure of the inside and outside, um, Jane Carter um, sewed beautiful Hessian curtains together. We wanted a natural material um, to go with the natural materials that we we're already using. So in the end, we have this joint of one piece relying on the other that is able to um, span in different directions. Um, and I suppose the interesting thing that we like about this is that all of the wood can be completely reused. We haven't taken away much from it. Maybe the ends need to be chopped off, but there's a still full integrity with the timber after using it. Um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. That was a, a really thorough piece of work and innovative from the point of view of finding a joint and allowing it become an architecture. Um, really thorough and stunning work. Thank you very much. Um, I suppose I'd like to begin to wrap up uh, with the questions and answers session. And we have 30 minutes. The bus is not going to leave until 4.30. So if anybody's anxious about getting the bus back, uh, there still is about 20 places on the bus, by the way, if anybody is feeling the need to take a lift with us back to Dublin City. Um, 
I'm, I'm quite struck by the variety and the diversity of responses to a very, very strong brief that the curator set. Uh, Sinjin and Ayat and Helmi and Mary, thank you. Um, I'm getting to know all your names. Um, it's, it's quite powerful and I was really taken by the I suppose the easy pickings, if I was to go back to what Yvonne was saying, um, what one tries to take from this, um, I felt there was a very, very interesting pause by the Estonians to act and to observe and analyze and respect something that is living before jumping into proposition and going as far as a joint, shall we say, as we've closed with workshop. And I'm, I'm also very conscious of the fact that you've all come together for probably one of the first times. All contributors here, you probably haven't seen each other in one space. And maybe to hear you talk about the process that you went through would be very interesting for me. Um, but just on that point, I suppose I would like to ask Sinjin and Ayat, maybe, or Helmi or Maria, that kind of duality of listening almost composing, thinking uh, in a very spiritual way to the other side of going immediately into the craft of making and producing and fabricating. Um, so maybe if I could begin maybe with yourselves and maybe respond to that with the contributors if they wish to further that particular point. Well. Is it on? Um, I, I think that the, I mean, seeing what the participants have made up there and that contrast mm. is between, um, between the work is, is really quite fascinating. It brings a real energy to it. Um, I think that there probably is um, something to be learned from that pause that the but that we in Ireland can think um, and can take. Certainly, I think that going forward, um, we, we have, I think, been very busy in Ireland and always are, seem to be in a bit of a rush. And maybe it's something that um, can be learned by looking outside. As architects, I think we do need to begin to um, maybe step back from our own process and think about buildings as not just fixed entities that we produce, get built. Rather, they're things which move and change and adapt over time. And that may encourage us to also take a little bit of a slower, longer pause and look at life. And that obviously that ties directly into how a tree comes about and mm. how it, it is brought into, into being and is then becomes you know, what, you know, what we imagine. I think also talks about agency and the, what a tree can give and how the those those sort of um, timber as a material can be a slower, more considered process, as was shown in Belfast and the, the backyards of Belfast, where it becomes something which might be, somebody might take a bit of time to consider how they will reuse something. You know, it, it, it sits against a wall. It, it gets a bit old and then it gets used and you know there's so there's that that commonality a, across the work um but I, I do think it it highlights just um maybe a a reappraisal about how we think about materials mm -hmm. and timber yeah um, uh, maybe a short comment to add up uh, i think when we see all the exhibits together and the idea is I think it's really a, like a reflection of the state of the world at the moment. So I think we are facing common questions and as I mean kind of stating the obvious but there is no clear answers yet. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to take this different path to understand how we proceed. Yeah. Can I ask another question maybe I'm thinking back to a very interesting book that has guided a lot of our thoughts in the School of Architecture at UL, which is Thomas Peter's book, Building the 19th Century. And it talks of an intelligence prior to concrete and steel becoming the norm. So there was craft in how to, I'm thinking of 
Shelley and Yvonne's presentation of the queen post, the twinning of timbers, the relationship of different species, almost like a boat, and how timbers work within a kind of a singular structure. Um, is there a need to go back in order to go forward when we think of the, the lack of evidence of timber, particularly in an Irish context, I would say. I'm recalling a visit I went to Tallinn um, for Europan many, many years ago, but there was an evidence of even medieval timber, speaking back to David's reference to Ernest in Norway, uh, buildings from 1,000 years ago that are still there. Um, somehow we have very, very easily forgotten that kind of culture of craft and intelligence when it comes to thinking about how timbers might join. And it's not necessarily something that one knows how to do until one tests and one makes. And I, I really enjoyed the point that Yvonne and Shelley were making when it came to structure and architecture almost fusing into one. And that somehow to understand timber, one needs to think both poetically and pragmatically. And I, I think I saw that in the Irish kind of participants' work, as well as in the very rich, uh, very esoteric and spiritual, I keep on saying, in the, the, the Estonians' work. But maybe that's something that Yvonne and Shelley might like to talk to, that, that need, perhaps, thinking back to how span and how joint and how craft might need to be reevaluated in this time, particularly when we have all of these facilities to hand, like computer, numerical cutting, etc., CNC, laser cutting, all of those amazing facets that we have to hand. Maybe you could say something to that. Do you want to answer that again? Well, I'll, I'll start. Thank you, uh, Peter. I think what is really uh, important to remember is that you know, the term the building industry, you know, that the, the building industry is like a kind of a, you know, galloping horses, you know, that, that I suppose what is really important is that, that a, a timber building is not just a concrete building transferred into another squishy kind of other material, that, that it has its own uh, strengths, it has its own spans. And that's what when, when Shelley and I were speaking, we were we were trying to describe like that the trucks that can bring the beams have a certain, you know, highways have a certain dimension. Uh, that what we build now is that there's fire is an issue, you know, all, all the kind of codes which make modern life safer uh, are all built into our understanding. Like we didn't know about the 40 foot and the 60 foot high, you know, kind of tied lines of safety. And that as, as a discipline, I suppose what's really very important is that that the the uh, that as architects that we make um uh, or that we demand first of all of, of the kind of design team itself like in that that there's a toing and froing about how to make but it uh, maybe Shelley will continue this point but I just like to uh, just for if I may uh, Peter that I really liked the you know, the, the, the symphony of the forest, even the word about the symphony of the forest. And I'd like to say that, that to that musician whose, whose grandmother told her that her mother told her how to whistle to make rain clouds go away, that, that it's also embedded in that is a real respect and, and love of timber. And I think when I hear musicians speak and I hear uh, a really, really wonderful day, guys, I really enjoyed every speaker. You learn so much from every human being's experience. But just that the that the musical instruments made from timber, that is the sound of timber and what that that you've made us think listening today, that that the building that we're trying to make with, with in, in Arkansas will also be a type of instrument that it'll sound different because I think the industry allows the timber, the, the CLT and the glue lambs to be an instrument. But it's gone off. It's gone off the topic you asked. Sorry, Shell, if you could pick up where, where I went yeah. off piece. Um, I think it must be partly to do with Zoom because Zoom always makes me feel um, impatient, and uh, it's not a very nice thing to witness. But um, what I find about today is that I'm impatient again because there's so much talent, there's so much skill. And why can we not make the conditions within which 
this can make a difference. How, what I mean? How do all you people, wonderfully talented, articulate people, how do you get to a point where you can really get involved? And I was thinking something similar about the industry because we've been looking at, I suppose, how we proceed as architects, given that the, the rules have changed and we all have to reconsider how we build. And I just wonder if the next pairing could be between the architects and some members of the industry, because there are also other young, um, younger generation uh, builders, fabricators, uh, whatever. How do we change the industry or adjust the industry? Because there are certain things you just can't do uh, because the industry has its power, uh, its commercial power. Uh, it has to change. Everything has to change if we're going to change the way we build. It's not just architects. We have to find the conditions within which we can collaborate with um, with the with the with the powers that be, let's say, and I'm not talking about big things or accessing work or whatever. It's just that there's so much energy in Ireland. There's so much talent in Ireland. There's so much skill. How does one address that? I know it's a it's a different issue, but there is also something about um, Yvonne. You mentioned the industry. What we're finding. Like there's a wonderful thing in Korea, you might say that it has its political problems and we just thought it was amazing because the school we're doing is a public project, three or four or five different quantity suppliers price the building and they get a builder to build it and he, he agrees to the price, he signs the contract and then he sees the drawings. Now, I'm not proposing we do that, but there are other ways of building. I mean, what's fantastic in Arkansas we have access to the builders who are going to build the building. And as Yvonne says, we, we can't go singing through the woods, picking the trees, but there's a kind of hands-on um, exchange, like uh, what we used to call direct labor, uh, or um, what do you call it, when you don't have a, a tender situation where you just, we built the longhouse with Jens Kuschenmeister. We didn't go to tender, and that was, Fantastic. You're working with a, a cabinet maker. Um, how does one find a way where all of this wonderful work can make a difference and can rise to the top, which is where it needs to be or deserves to be? I don't know the answer, but I, I find it continually... Um, Frustrating because I, I want to see buildings, schools, houses, building, you know, housing, um, whatever, by all these architects who've presented this morning. And then the cross cultural connections is wonderful. Um, so it's the Zoom that makes me like this, I'm afraid. Um, if I was down there, I wouldn't feel like this. But uh, it's funny when you watch at a distance, you need the conditions within which to change. But it is true to say that that this exhibition and today is 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 also a way of 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 uh, the energy and the mehel, the old Irish word that that between Estonia and Ireland, you now have a, a have a warrior class of people who have met each other, who have taken a team, and you know the uh, the, the the combination of of uh, and the introduction of, of uh, earlier on, um, you know it's, it's terrific to watch. So. Change the world, guys. To go and buy mushroom knives, and we're all <laughs> going to go to Estonia on Tulicki's offer and play a green accordion to the trees and listen to the seven planets of whatever yeah. Tulicki has Probably. composed. <laughs> um, I'd like to, that, that's, that's a wonderful and provocative question to ask, and a very pertinent one to leave us with. Um, Shelley and Yvonne, I think a paradigm shift is required and access to work that entails working with 
timber um, with industry partners is, is really, really important. And we need to see that as early as possible in schools of architecture, as well as uh, young generations of architects coming through. Could I open it to the audience? And if there are members of the public who maybe not are architects, um, there's a few roving microphones, and I'd welcome any questions or maybe answers, as the case may be.